Welcome back, everybody, to Cage My IQ. As always, I'm your host, Cage. Join with me, as always, is my co-host, Miles Long and our mascot. Right. How is it going, yeah, Miles? Back. Not bad. Just here with my co-pilot, Charles Levere, and we got our mascot. He's real needy tonight, so he's going to be popping in and out of the broadcast for sure, but it's nice to have us both back in one place. Kind of missed a, missed a card last week, and then week before, I was out, so... Nice to be back to normal. As you guys saw, I put my picks out just on uh, Twitter and on Instagram. Of course, I had COVID for a few days, so I wasn't a- able to record. So apologize for everybody that tunes in weekly. But as you see, we're back regular uh, hey. than ever. So we're looking forward to doing our picks and predictions today for UFC 293, which is live from Sydney, Australia. This Saturday, it's headlined by Israel Azasana versus Sean Strickland for the UFC middleweight championship. And then we even have a fun co-main event in the heavyweight division between Tai Tuyavasa versus Alexander Volkov. Before we get into any of that, as always, this is Cage My Q. You can find us on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Twitch, and on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel at Cage My IQ. As you see right there, the Twitch sit channel said, says at Bloodline ENT. That is in the in the process of being changed. We're changing network names. Uh, we used to be called Bloodline ENT. It's getting changed. All I can tell you right now is hashtag fanatics. We're going to be going live this Saturday to talk hey. about the new name, new logo. Hey. Uh, the new start to the uh, to the network. It's still the same YouTube channel, same Instagram, and same uh, Twitter slash X uh, for the old Bloodline Entertainment Network. But it's going to be a new name. So keep an eye on everything on our social media platforms. But other than that, you can find us always on the Cage My IQ YouTube channel. And make sure you definitely subscribe to the Cage My IQ Twitter, as you see there, at Cage IQ, I post all the content, all the picks, Cage's bet slips on there. So if you can't find anything on the on the new network name, you can definitely find it on the Cage IQ Twitter. But also, we got the merch out for Cage by IQ. We're actually developing the new shirt uh, at Fighters First with the new logo. As you see, we've had a new logo for a couple months uh, the old one was the sword and shield one. We're still going to be putting, pushing that out on fightersfirst.shop, as you see right there. But keep a lookout in the next couple weeks for the new logo with the fist that we got. But definitely go to fightersfirst.shop, search uh, the the log for the, the sword and shield logo in white, green, and gray. And definitely check out all the other merchandise that he has on there from WWE to other wrestling to MMA, to kickboxing, you name it, in combat sports. Mike Ginn has you covered at fightersfirst.shop. Uh, other than that, all I ask what you guys to do, if you're just tuning in for the first time, smash the like button down below. Don't forget to subscribe to both YouTube channels. Uh, and then please hit us up in the comment section. I want to know what picks you're going with this Saturday's pay-per-view and what the bets that you're looking to go forward to. And let me know what you think of ours. We've been putting them out for you guys. We, and we dive into that a little bit. I give you guys the, uh, the cages bets, up, which has been done doing a great job the last month. So definitely keep an eye on that. And it gives any uh, thoughts of what you're going to go with from a Ben standpoint uh, for UFC 293. But other than that, let's get started. We got 12 fights going on most most of them are going to be with city kickboxing uh fighters they're definitely going to be representing australia new zealand on this card as last week where they definitely represented korea on that card i don't blame them for doing it to get the exposure within the country it's it's the right move to make it's just i don't think this card is as stacked as it should be but this is the route they made. Uh, they're definitely trying to. They tried to do the best, pleasing people, but then booking a good title fight. And then there was a couple of cancellations on the fight that definitely hurt this card. But at, at least we got some decent 
big card fights, but let's start it out with the first fight on the prelims. As you see the, right there, we got a men's welterweight matchup between Kevin Jacet versus Keeper Crosby. We got Jacet coming out city kickbox, and he's the minus 135 favorite. We got Keeper Crosby, who's coming in at the plus 110 underdog. Uh, what are your thoughts on this fight? Uh, these are both unknowns. Uh, this is both their debuts in the UFC, which is rare. You don't see that very often. That's like some shit you see on a Bellator card where they're willing to like take a chance on some newcomers. And I mean, these guys have fairly deep records already, but like on Bellator, sometimes they'll get like the, you know, zero and zero guys versus the, you know, oh and one guy, but they're neither of them been on Bellator before. So it's kind of interesting to see UFC taking two in two complete unknowns for their debut and put them against each other. Usually that's what like gatekeepers are for, right? Like just give them something that's not impossible, but it'll definitely kind of give you an idea of what their skill range in the UFC will look like relative to where they fought before. Um, so this one actually might give them more of a fighting chance to put on a better performance, but I don't really know much about these guys other than uh, Giuseppe obviously trains out of city kickboxing, so he's going to want to stand and train a lot. That's kind of what they're known for. It's their whole shtick. Uh, versus um, Crosby uh, looks to be a little bit more well-rounded. Um, he does have some fights in Bellator, which is definitely UFC adjacent. Um, in some divisions, I would say it's equally competitive. Uh, but I mean, yeah, he seems to be able to do a lot more grappling, but he's also got like knockout finishes. Um, looks like most of his wins come by knockout with five wins by KO, uh, two submission wins and three decisions. So it seems like he's just kind of, oh, he's okay everywhere. And my big concern with you said coming out of city kickboxing is that some of the city kickboxing guys don't know shit about grappling. So like, you know, if, if Crosby has that grappling ability and sure enough, Jusset has no wins by submission. It's not even something he's thinking about. It's not even in the ballpark for him. So I think if if Crosby gets any amount of grappling going, I think that's that's pretty much it. Jusset's probably cooked. If he gets pinned on the cage, he won't be able to separate, put it back in striking range. If he gets on the mat and Crosby's on top, like he's that's it. Like he just got he just stole the round. So I'm just again, I don't know nothing about these guys, but just based on that. I'd probably be leaning more towards Crosby, but because they're two complete unknowns, I ain't touching this one with betting. There's no fucking, no shot, no shot. Yeah, I look at this one. Uh, you got Keeper Crosby. He's really good inside. I wouldn't say inside clinch, but inside the pocket. He's really good with the striking. He has good hands, good movement there, and he's decent inside the clinch. He has good uh, hand speed. And then you got Kevin Jacet. Typical uh, city kickboxing. He's good from a distance with his kickboxing. He has good uh, movement. His just weakness would be if he gets inside, uh, he's going to get hit a lot. But if he could keep the distance, that's where he's going to prefer to fight against a guy like Crosby. And just like you said, he has limited uh, grappling. If you look at his history of his fighting, he hasn't really fought that many people with great records. He fought a guy that was 11 and 1, I believe it was. And it was a 40 year old guy who didn't fight often, but was good enough to have a, a like 11 and 1 record. Other than that, he's fought a guys with like barely any experience. And, he, and then some of those fights went to split decision or he barely won those. He looked good in his last fight, but there's really no fight that st stood out with him other than the fact that he trains at Kitty uh, City Kickboxing. That's what stands out with him is where he trains at and whatnot. But he doesn't really have the overall uh, uh, fight experience uh, to really pinpoint this guy is going to be dominant. Whereas, just like you say, Kiefer uh, Crosby has just enough in each avenue to where he could He's not going to be one of those guys who gets up in the rankings, but he might be a guy in the mid tier where he, okay. he like he's going to get a couple wins, maybe lose, but then get a couple wins and then stay in that like twenty to thirty range because he can he can strike, he can grapple with you, he, he has decent leg kicks, like he has uh, his hand speed and fighting inside uh, the uh, the clinch is where he's going to win this fight. I think this is a twenty nine and twenty eight. 
a decision win for him. I feel like Jacek can have a round where his distance were create problems maybe in the beginning for Crosby. But once yeah. Crosby gets going with the striking and he can find his way inside the pocket, I feel I feel like that's when he's going to have success here. And then you look at the the gap difference in the, the betting, uh, like I would have thought it would have been flipped. So maybe I might just like go with like a money line on Crosby thinking that, that he should be able to pull it out, especially with him being the underdog. I don't mind throwing anything small on him with him being plus 110. Like, if he was minus 135 like Jacette was, I'd probably stay away from it. But knowing that he is the the underdog in this, I might throw like a 0.5 units on him, like half a unit, just with the money line. I won't go anything uh, crazy with it. It would probably just be that. Other than that, I'm with you on this. It's, it's too crazy of a entry level fight for both guys for me to very deep dive betting into this one. Yeah, that's a pretty open and check case. I think that's yeah. all we can say about it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on to the second fight on the prelim, we have a matchup in between in the featherweight division between Shane Young versus Gabriel Miranda. Shane Young comes in at minus one sixty five. Also from City Kickboxing. And then you got Gabriel Miranda, who comes in as the underdog, plus 140. What are your thoughts on this prelim? I'm probably going to be repeating myself a whole lot tonight, just because like it's a lot of City Kickboxing guys, and all the City Kickboxing guys have the same basic issue. As soon as you start grappling with them, they, they suddenly run out of answers very, very fast. And this is pretty much Shane Young's problem. Like his last time out with Blake Builder, he just he got demolished in the wrestling. That's what that's what cost him that fight. He did okay when he was trading. You know, he's he seems like he's got some power. Like I would say he's not a power striker. He's like just a little bit above average. Um, his volume is you know about average. He has a sense of like when he needs to get going a little bit and when he can kind of take some time to take some reads. But, you know, he's not, you know, striking fear in the heart of his opponents with his striking power. He'll catch you, you know, like he definitely caught, I think, Builder. He caught him a couple of times with some solid punches. But it's not like, you know, Builder was afraid of the big bomb coming that could end the whole damn thing. And that's what gave him the confidence to move in, start wrestling. And once that wrestling started going, once he figured out, oh, when I get Shane on the mat and I'm on top, he's cooked. There's nothing he can do. Like, I think he got up maybe one time, but not even. So, you know, you got the same basic problem there versus Gabriel Miranda has 15 wins by submission, 15 <laughs> wins by submission. And a lot of more recent too. his most recent win was a, a rear naked choke. And now that was before he came into the UFC. Um, he did lose to Benet Saint-Denis, uh, but Benet Saint-Denis, it turns out he's actually a pretty legit guy. Because I remember his debut was the fight with Zelecki, Zelecki, yeah, Zelecki Dos Anjos. Uh, where everyone is like, stop the fight. And the ref's like, no, if he dies, he dies. That's it. Like, that's not my responsibility. <laughs> like, But ever yeah. since then, Denis has been like on a, on a pretty good tear here. And so uh, it looks like Miranda kind of got caught up in that tear. And he lost to Denis. And it was the second round, got knocked out. Solid right hook. And then just ground and pounded out. Um, but again, Shane Young doesn't have that kind of power. He doesn't have St. Denis power. He's more of like he's going to put points up on the board. If you get sloppy, he'll catch you with something. He'll sting you, and he'll stun you a little bit. Um, but he's not like laying dudes out the way St. Denis has been doing recently. So I think there's not as much for uh, Miranda to kind of worry about. I think he's definitely going to be able to get his grappling going. And if history shows anything, once that happens, he pretty much has his way. Like he's got all kind of rear naked guillotine. This one just says submission, triangle choke, arm bar. Another guillotine, another rear naked. Like he can pretty much get it done as soon as it hits the mat. And yeah. that's one of the things that the kid city kickboxing guys are not very well equipped to do is stop it from hitting the mat. If you go to the mat with this guy, that's it. I think he could finish him as soon as it touches the mat. Because I don't I don't I didn't see anything from Shane Young in his last fight telling me that he could deal with Miranda's level of skill to get back on the feet and make it a kickboxing match again. So this seems pretty open and shut. I think Miranda's probably just going to find his timing. It might be – I don't know, I haven't seen him fight, so he might have kind of a slow first again. Uh, I missed the St. Denis fight, 
So he might have a slow first. There is a chance that Young could maybe take that first round real quick. But after that, I think once Miranda finds the timing, that's it. As soon as he finds his openings for those takedowns, it's going to hit the mat. And then it's going to be a matter of minutes until he finds that choke. Because Young notoriously is not very good at navigating that. So it's going to be a win by submission. This one, to me, depends on uh, how Shane Young can defend the, the takedown because Gabriel Moran is not a wrestling uh, artist. Yeah. It's more of a jiu-jitsu uh, background with his uh, takedowns, and it's easier to defend those than it is a wrestling takedown because of the different levels of takedowns, like single leg, double leg, uh, just the way you shoot in and everything. There's so much more to dissect with that then with the jiu-jitsu guy who's more looking just to get the body lock leg trip that's basically what they look into so i feel like uh if one thing that shane young like I, i'm i'm like a 50 50 on this one one thing that if shane young can keep the distance and then just keep it a kickboxing fight and not trying to go for the knockouts like he usually does he has success with kickboxing range it's when he looks to go for the kill and throw, throws those big uh, uh, like uh, blows, that's when he usually loses a fight or goes away from the game plan. Uh, okay. If he can defend the takedown and then just get up in points, he can gain some confidence and then he can uh, start doing well because Miranda is hittable in fights. You saw in the Benoit St. Denis fight, he's very yeah. hittable. He got hit a lot with just those big over wide blows uh, that he just he shouldn't have dealt with because otherwise he was doing well in that fight and then he was just getting hit with those. So like his defense isn't the best. But then on the other side, Shane Young uh, was doing well against uh, Blake Bildor, but then he kept on getting taken down and then hit with easy shots. So it's like it's a low level fight and in this in this range, I always pick the guy with the more experience because I don't know what I'm going to expect with Gabriel or Miranda because he's only fought once in the UFC against Benoit St. Denis, who has looked good lately, but it's like that doesn't prove anything to me with Miranda. I know Shane Young has lost, but I can at least know that he can fight from a distance and he's fought a pretty good competition. So even though I'm not high on this fight, I'm going to go Shane Young by decision. (laughs) Like, uh, I, I could care less who wins, but uh, just from a pick yeah. paint standpoint, I'm going chain young by decision. I think he can throw more volume if he stays more disciplined from a uh, from a kickboxing range standpoint. Uh, I know it's a minus 165, but I'm still staying away from it. But I will say, bet this live after round one, if it gets to that point, uh, because I feel like whoever the underdog is has a good shot. Or if... Gabriel Miranda wins and he's still plus or Gabriel Miranda is still in that plus yeah, in range yeah. and uh, and he wins round one or something make sure you bet him right there because I, I feel like Shane Young could slow down after uh, after the it seven is. minute mark uh, and yeah. it's going to become I mean he slows down murkier. even when you pin him on the cage yeah. he gets tired just from yeah. that so it's like you know so it's like uh, just like the first one, not much to go from, but like, yeah. I, I think that this is a fight that maybe you do over one and a half rounds. I think that might be the best bet yes. on, on this one, depending on what it is, because other than that, <laughs> I don't bad. see a finish going on unless it's around too late or round three. I just don't see yeah. these guys as big finishers. Uh, I mean, this whole card's pretty mid. I mean, we're not going to get anything really interesting until we hit the main yeah. card. So we could just breeze through these. Like, yeah. these are pretty low <laughs> stakes, to be honest. Yeah. Like, this is just for city kickboxing to do some marketing. That's what it is. Like, yeah. they just they want the big marketing card. So they got all their guys lined up. So, all right, let's keep going. <laughs> let's move on to the welterweight division. We got a matchup between Blood Diamond going up against Charlie Racky. Bloodline Diamond is coming in as the plus 195 underdog, whereas Charlie Racky is coming in at that minus 250 favorite mark. Uh, what are your thoughts on this matchup? It's pretty much the same thing. And, like, it's even kind of worse. Like, at least Shane Young, like, he, he went up against, like, real talent here. Like, he drew Volkanovsky on his freaking debut, which is a huge, huge ass. Because even at the time, Volkanovsky was still undefeated. 
Um, he still went through his last three uh, losses were, of course, Builder, but he also lost to Omar Morales and Ludwig Klein, guys who are a little bit more well-rounded. They do know their way around, like, wrestling on the cage. They're strong. They're very quick. So, like, I can kind of see why Shane Young got outshone, but, like, two of those losses were decisions, so at least he could, like, keep up with them, right? He wasn't getting, like, demolished the minute, you know, one thing went wrong. Uh, I think even with Builder, he was, you know, able to maintain – some distance throughout that fight, then that's where he really scored the most points, even though he lost the fight. Um, I think that's, you know, I think he took maybe, I think it was the second round just because of his striking, his ability to maintain distance. Um, but unfortunately with Blood Diamond, on the other hand, you you kind of have like, it's it's almost hopeless. Like even on the, um, on the betting odds, this is like the only dude from City Kickboxing who's not the favorite. And for good reason, the minute he gets even a little bit of wrestling resistance, he just he folds like a deck of cards. When he's up on the cage, he can't get out. He can't put it back into the striking range to make it a kickboxing match, which is his forte. When he's on the mat, he's just absolutely cooked. The minute he's on his back and there's a dude on top, he tends to just burn the rest of the round out. He's trying to get up, but he just he can't really. Um, and that's pretty much what happened to him in his last fight against... Um, uh, Kosi, where Kosi just got a little bit of grappling going. It wasn't even like a huge amount because like his debut was Jeremiah Wells, who Jeremiah Wells like wrestled him into oblivion and choked him out in the first round. But like we know Jeremiah Wells is very powerful, very well-rounded grappler. He's got excellent credentials. So like we kind of, you know, we knew that was going to happen. Uh, but then with Kosi, the point was that like, yeah, he can grapple, but he's not that great at any one thing. He's balanced, but he's not really a star at wrestling. He's not really a star at striking. He's just pretty mid across the board. He just has a good balance of skills. So that was supposed to give Blood Diamond more of a sh more of a fighting chance there. But even still, like he got a little bit of resistance on the cage in the first round, and he couldn't really find a good solution for that. And then what happened the next round? Pretty much the same thing. Uh, uh, Kosi was like, oh, this is how I'm going to win. So then he pins him. And then he figures out, well, if I take him down, then he really can't do anything. So that's that became his strategy. And he just kind of burned out the clock. And, and, you know, Blood Diamond wasn't really able to get his offense going in any meaningful way. And here you've got uh, a guy in, in you know, Rad – how do you say that? Radtick? Radtick? Radtick. 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 That – that's not okay. There's no, there's not enough fouls in that name, but Radke. So with Radke, he Rad, actually Radke, does Radke. Have, yeah. I mean, something. I don't know. It's a yeah. foreign name, uh, but he actually does have a decent amount of uh, grappling experience in competitive leagues. It is his debut. That's true. Uh, but he has fought in both CFCC, CFFC and Bellator. He, um, he the, has he, two he was, right. He was just, uh, he won, he won the, the middleweight, uh, yeah, the oh, middleweight yeah, uh, right. title in CFFC against Forrest, in, and then he defended yeah, it and Forrest, right yeah. before he made him the call up. So, I mean, this guy definitely knows what he's doing when it comes to grappling, and I think if he's yeah. been paying any amount of attention, he knows exactly what he has to do to shut Blood Diamond down and just put him in a position where he has no answers. And that's the thing, like, you know, even if Blood Diamond can maintain the distance for a little bit, he's not great at maintaining the clinch range. And that's one thing mm -hmm. that Adesanya outshines all these guys on is being able to work in the clinch. He's gotten way better about when he hits the mat, he's able to get up right away. He's able to stuff takedowns. Those are the fundamental skills. A lot of these guys just don't really have. Um, and blood diamond is probably the most lacking in all of those anti grappling skills. So yeah, I think yeah. Radke is, is the favorite for a reason and he's probably going to, uh, submit him pretty quickly or he could maybe get a ground and pound if he maybe stuns him a little bit wrestles him takes him down and wants to finish it that way but i definitely see a submission is, is more likely here given his credentials and his background yeah then you got to look at the fact that blood diamond is only three and two in his whole career and then that yeah. doesn't include the the couple kickboxing fights because that's what his background is is he's a kickboxer yeah. that's his expertise 
That's what got him there. And he kind of doesn't really have that much uh, level of uh, grapple or, or jiu-jitsu. It's mainly the the kickboxing, uh, kickboxing striking that he has. Uh, and that's why you see guys like Alexander Volkanovsky bring him in as like a, a, like a partner to come in to help him train against a kickboxer. If you watch the embedded um, right right as he was getting ready for the Yair Rodriguez fight, that's why he brought him in to, to help him out with the range and everything because he's great at range. But it's when guys get up close to Blood Diamond is where he struggles with. He struggles with the, the takedown defense. He struggles within the clinch because he's primarily a distance striker. He can get going within the distance. He has knockout power. It's just that he can't deer with the, the mixed – Part of mixed martial arts, he just can't deal with it. And Charlie Radke, from what I what I've seen from him, is he has good hands, he has good power, but then he has good uh, grappling as well. He can take the fight to the ground and submit you, and he can work with you on the ground. Uh, and for him to get a fight like this in his debut uh, favors him, and that's why his mind's two fifty is the fact that uh, he is a guy that will be able to take Blood Diamond to the mat and challenge him there and make him work. And I could see two different things happen. That's why I like the inside the distance here because I could see him knocking out Blood Diamond from inside the clinch with like an elbow or along the cage, or I could see him taking him to the mat and winning by rear naked choke because I feel like Blood Dime is not very competent enough to defend the takedowns and to defend uh, the grapple because he's not a guy that is on that level to where he can work from being taken down and getting up. Some guys just don't learn that. They can get to the UFC. They just can't learn how to get up or how to move positions to get up once they're down they're down and this is a guy that's there because he works primarily on the kickboxing style of things and it's going to take a while for him to to learn everything else he got there so quick that he didn't give himself enough time to uh to add that second layer to his game so he's he's getting that early start to where he's probably going to lose he's probably going to get uh, sent down and then he's going to have to rework his whole game to add it because I don't think he's uh, too old. I think he is. Oh, never mind. He's 35. Yeah. He's too old. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. He's up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he's too old. So like, is it that at, at, I, we'd like to say at 35, he's to that point to where you can't change him. So like he might get sent down and then his best bet would probably be to go to glory kickboxing. To where he can oh, use man. it, like we've only seen like a few guys lately that can break through, like a uh, like Adesana. You got a Fajeda, guys that can kind of like deal with it. And I think Fajeda was kind of that distance. I mean that that one of those wild cards because he trains with guys at high level and he has somewhat of a background in jujitsu. But this guy doesn't have a background at all. So, like, for me, I, I like Trotty Radke by round two submission. I go rear naked choke. Uh, I have to see what the, the prop is for him. Uh, but I do like inside the distance because it covers both ways because he, he has a mixed bag when it comes to winning inside distance. He has some knockouts. He has some submissions. It just depends on how you feel uh, about him in this matchup and – I'm trying to bring it up right now on this one. And right now, him by KO is plus 275. Him by submission is plus 175. Hit Radcate inside the distance is minus 130. So minus 130 is not too bad if you want to cover both sides. But definitely picking what method is going to get you in that plus range. But if you want to play it safe, go inside the distance. It's minus. Uh, it's like a, like I said. It's minus one thirty, which is still really good, yeah, compa- uh, considering the fact that Blood Diamond only has a striking background, and and this guy's coming in uh, with a minus two fifty, which a guy coming in on his first fight doing that, I don't see that many guys getting that that much hype for that, and it's not like he's getting so much hype. It's just that he's. They're hyping him on the bed nods because we know the weaknesses of Blood Diamond. So, like, yeah. you know, 
it, I think I say look at it live or go with the inside the distance. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's move on to the next fight on the prelim. We got a lightweight matchup between Nazrat at Hack Press versus Landon Canones, uh, alumni of this past season's the <laughs> Ultimate Fighter. Uh, yeah, they're oh fighting boy. in the lightweight division. We got Nazrat, who's the minus 410 heavy favorite. And then we got Canones, who's the plus 320 underdog. And I believe he took this fight on short notice. Uh, what, did, are your yeah. thoughts, what are your thoughts on this fight? Man, this whole card is pretty mid. And this is probably one of the most mid fights on the whole damn card. Like, Hackerest, I remember they gave him a few shots at stardom here and there because when he, I remember when he got into the UFC, he was he was all right. He did lose his uh, his debut against uh, Marcin Held, but then he beat the KC. He had a couple of uh, like Gaudi Silva people who were less big names. So then they gave him a shot at Drew Dober. Drew Dober's at the time pretty classic like gatekeeper sort of fighter. Lost to Dober, but then he came back on a two-fight winning streak against Alexander Munoz and Rafa Garcia. And they're like, okay, let's give him another shot. He got a shot at Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker won the decision. And then they were like, well, you know, he has a bit of a following now. Um, Maybe we give him Bobby Green, make it kind of like a fan favorite sort of pick. Lost to Bobby Green in the decision. And so now he's kind of back to fighting the undercard he just beat, uh, McDessie. So, like, with um, with Hockerest, like, he every time he's approached top 15 talent, he just can't quite do it. This guy seems to be capped at like maybe top 20 at best. Because as soon as you get past that, it just gets too competitive. And again, he's he's just kind of average all around. He clearly knows his way around the wrestling. He can strike, but it's not the most powerful. His output usually just mirrors whatever his opponent does. Um, he's not like really a, a big star in any given field, but he has a decent enough balance to where um, he's, you know, mostly a decision fighter now that he's inside the UFC. In fact, you think he's only had, yeah, he's only had one win by knockout uh, inside the UFC. That was against uh, Joaquin Silva. Uh, the rest of his wins have all been decisions inside the UFC. So he's pretty much the picture of a decision fighter. And uh, Quinones, like, man, that that was one of the things about this past season of Ultimate Fighter. It's like, I get what they were going for, and it sounds cool on paper. You got, like, the old pissed-off vets that, you know, want to get back in, and then you got the young, hungry talent. Let's see who's hungrier, yeah. right? It's a cool idea, but then immediately you see, like, there is a difference between the fighters who have been to the UFC and the fighters who have not. And it was a fucking blowout. And, and unfortunately, Quinones was like one of the worst ones. He got submitted like immediately by Jason Knight. Jason Knight's a brawler, not like a technical jujitsu artist. But this kid just ran headlong into a triangle choke and just got tapped. What was it like? Fifteen seconds. Uh, it was. It was. Oh, fifty-five seconds. My bad. Fifty-five seconds. He, he, took, he took him down. He controlled him, and and then. He got locked right into the guillotine, yeah, just like he that. walked right like, into it. And then, and then Jason it. Knight talked shit afterwards, saying, yeah. "I told you, you're gonna take me down. I'm gonna uh, submit yeah. you." And that's what. That's it's not what even happened. really his like. That's not even really his wheelhouse. Yeah. Like he has jujitsu, but he doesn't use yeah. it in the UFC, and it's just different if you're not actively using it in your fights at this level. And we, but like, and we, read, yeah. and we read, we didn't, we, did, we read it. We, get to see enough of him because just like you said, it was right. only 55 seconds. That was his only fight. So there was, it was really like an incomplete on what he had uh, to go with. And then I just want to give my quick thing on this real quick before uh, you keep going. But like, I'm just going to yeah. go Nazrat hack brass by uh, decision just because we've seen him get on these two, three fight win streaks and he loses a fight that, uh, that is like pretty well up there. And it's always the same thing. Like, he's always high volume. He has a good pace. He has great cardio. He can wrestle with you. He just sometimes doesn't use it. And it's always a guy that's going to out-volume him a little bit more to just outdo him. Uh, just like you said, Bobby Green out-volumed him. Uh, we kind of saw that coming because Bobby Green could push the pace later. And he just edged him out there. Dan Hooker 
same thing. Dan Hooker is a guy that can brawl with you. Drew Dover uh, got him uh, by ground and pound. Uh, that was one of the times we've seen him finished in a fight. Actually, the only time he's been finished uh, other than decision decisions uh, in his career because he lost by decision to Marcin Held uh, years ago as well. And the sneaky thing with him is we've seen that Landon Canotis kind of is susceptible to be taken down or submitted on the mat. We know Nazrak can kind of dig into that wrestle and, and take you down a couple of times if he needs to be. And after seeing that, you know, he might look to do that. But he's going to be the guy that is more than likely going to win by decision. And the decision prop bet right now to win by decision is plus 115. And it's in that plus range. So if you know a guy's yeah, mostly yeah. winning by, uh, by decision no matter what, and when he loses – it's always by decision, and he's only had one finish. Even though he's gone up against a guy in Landon Canonas, who primarily uh, got finished in that tough fight uh, in the first round, it was by sub. And we know we haven't seen any of that uh, by Nazareth in the past. So uh, if you look at the numbers, you're going to think, okay, Nazareth is the better fighter. He was already booked for this fight. Landon takes it on short notice. And on top of that, majority of his fights are by decision, and you're giving me plus 115 to win by decision. I feel like that's the thing to go with. You go with yeah. Nazrat by decision, plus 115, and then you ride it because you're not going to go with money line. That's minus 410. And it's hard to go with either knockout or submission because you where you don't see him knocking a guy out and you've never seen him submit a guy. So it's like the only one here that's logical is him by decision. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense, especially considering like Landy Quinones did take this on short notice because he actually yeah. went back to fight at Titan FC. He is fresh yeah. off of a win, actually. It was a decision win. But if you look at his Titan FC record, it's seven and one. That's an impressive record. Yeah. The minute he touches actual UFC talent, he gets submitted in 55 seconds, and that's against Jason Knight. That's like Jason Knight lost his contract a while ago, and it's because he was on a pretty bad losing streak. So when you go up against someone like uh, um, Nazareth, who has a very good balance of skills, he has you know very good fight sense. Like That's why a lot of his wins are by decision, because let's say his strategy is to go in with his striking and out volume, but then he's in catching too much power. Then he knows, okay, I got to switch gears. I got to wrestle a little bit. That way, you know, the damage that the judges are seeing is kind of offset by the fact that I have like two minutes of control time and the other guy doesn't. Yeah. So he can steal rounds like that. I think Quinones doesn't have that fight IQ yet. I think when he comes to this level of competition, he's it's just a little bit out of his reach. Uh, because when you look at it, his Titan FC record, it's, it's nearly flawless. And the main blemish is when he actually fought a UFC fighter. And Hazarad is at least winning. Jason Knight wasn't winning there at the end, and he hasn't been in the UFC for a minute. So, I mean, I think Hazarad has enough skill and, and you know, balance to just kind of control whatever's happening. So even if Queen Ones does come out with, like, pretty decent power, something we haven't seen before, Nazarat will be able to handle it because he's seen it before. He's able to go, okay, maybe if it's too hard of striking, we're going to switch to wrestling. We're going to tie you out a little bit. Maybe if he is going heavy on the wrestling, well, Nazarat will go, okay, well, I'll stay with you on the cage a little bit, but then we're going to separate and I want to strike so I can get some volume up on the cards. That way, even though we have fairly even control time, it's my volume that steals the round. So I think that that fight IQ and that ability to just control the situation, that's going to be what gets him the decision. Yeah. Um, that's that's pretty much what gets him the decision a lot of the time too. So this one's a pretty open and shut for me. It's it's going to be Hazaret by decision. It's not going to be an interesting fight, but you know. <laughs> yeah. There you let's, go. Let's move on to the next fight on the prelims. We have a lightweight matchup between Jamie Malarkey going up against John Macdesi. Jamie Malarkey is a city kickboxing fighter. He's coming in as the minus 190 favorite, whereas McDesi comes in as the plus 155 underdog. What are your thoughts on this one? I mean, these guys are actually weirdly a little bit similar, where Malarkey is is mostly he wants to stand and trade. Obviously, he's a kickboxing guy. Um, but he has shown the ability to be able to hang when it comes to the grappling. I would say behind Adesanya, he's probably like, 
one of the more experienced city kickboxing grappling guys. Like he seems to not like he's not beating anybody by submission anytime soon. But like I remember when I saw, I think it was on that um yeah, I think it was the Karma Worthy fight where there was a little bit of ground exchange and he wasn't totally outclassed. Like he actually did okay. I was a little surprised and he ended up getting that win by by a knockout in the first round. And there was some scrambles in there. And there was a moment where it looked like Karma Worthy might turn the tables on him and submit him. Um, but he was able to maintain his composure, keep calm, and, and get back to his feet, put the fight back in the situation where he's most comfortable with. So I would say he's he's not an amazing wrestler, uh, but I think he's definitely, on this card, one of the more experienced city kickboxing guys when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, his, in terms of his actual um, punching power, I feel like he had more punching power when he came into the UFC. Like he has 10 knockouts, but the vast majority of those are in the uh, other professional leagues. So super fight, urban fight, uh, brace, AFC. That's where he got the vast majority of his knockouts. Um, and then once he came into the UFC, he kind of started a little hot. He did lose to Brad Riddell in his, um, in his debut. And then Ferris Ziem, he also lost the decision. Ziem's a pretty good decision fighter too. Uh, but then once he he managed to knock out Karma Worthy, he went on a bit of a streak, knocked out Devontae Smith, um, and then he got two decisions, uh, Michael Johnson and Francisco uh, Parado. Uh, but then, of course, in between, he did get knocked out by Jillian Turner that one time. But, you know, we don't talk about that. But, um, yeah, it, he's kind the, of a balance the, between. And then the yeah. last fight that he just lost where he was dominating, oh, yeah. and then he gets finished. Knocked out, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he's kind of a balance between like sometimes he can bring the power when he needs to and he can get that knockout. But for the most part, I think he's more like he's he's not like super high volume like Max Holloway, like high volume, low power. He's like moderate power in about moderate volume. Like he'll be a little more patient. He'll pick his, his shots, but he's also got that kickboxing background that makes him aware like I have to be active. I have to be putting points on the card. I can't just sit here and do a counter game the whole time. Otherwise, he's just going to win because I'm not doing enough, right? So he is kind of a good balance in there in his striking. And if it gets into a grappling match, he can mostly kind of get through the wheeze. Now, McDessey, I think, has a clear power advantage. That's the big thing I see from McDessey. Um, when he actually hits, like in his last fight that I saw, what was his last fight? Hold on, I didn't pull up his his thing yet. Uh, John McDessey, there he is. His last fight was against. Uh, oh, it was against Hackerast, actually. <laughs> was it the Hackerast fight? I saw? Yep. Yeah. Oh no, I saw the uh, Bahamundes fight. So Bahamundes, Ignacio Bahamundes, definitely like a big, big boy for that division. Very powerful for that division too. Um, he came in off that K uh, Dana White Contender Series knockout, and then he went on a bit of a streak uh, because of his length, his reach, and his power. He had like a, what was it, a three-fight winning streak there for a little bit, but McDessey is the one who kind of like interrupted that streak a little bit, um, and then of course recently he just lost to uh, Ludwig Klein. Um, but one of the things that kept McDessey in that fight was one, the balance of skills. He's able to wrestle, and he's pretty good at it too. Um, he's, he's fairly decent, even against a guy like Bahu Mundes, who's like really big and long and yeah. that's sort of its own takedown defense. It was the power that made Bahu Mundes respect him um, in the striking. So he had, again, moderate volume, but then when he would sting Bahu Mundes, he stunned him bad a couple of times. I remember he stunned him once, almost finished it in the first round, and then I think it happened again in the third round. But ultimately, he took that decision. Um, so I think with the power imbalance... And these guys, you know, their skills are so roughly even. I would say since McDessey just has a little bit more power on his side. And when we look at the the um, their records as well. Oh, wait, I'm on Ignacio Bahamundes. We look at how long the record is. Like, Jesus. Uh, uh, 16, McDessey has 16, been fighting. 18, and, yeah. Well, he's been inside the UFC since 2010. So he, yeah. has, he is a vet. He is a vet. Whereas... Uh, you know, Malarkey has been in since 2019, like a relatively newcomer. So I think that deep experience plus the power advantage, I think is going to help him out a lot, especially if Malarkey is like, coming I feel in like they, here and there. I got to look because I feel like they fought almost about the same amount of fights in the UFC because oh, no, there's a no, long no. Like Dusty has way mm -hmm. more fights in the UFC. Like it's insane how many fights. Um, let me count them real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, oh, no, 13, yeah. 14, 15, 14. 16, 17, 18. 
I'm counting 19. I may have it missed my numbers, way he, it, it just feels that way there. because he has a he, it feels that way because he has that long gap and then and then yeah. you got one, two, three. We also have Malarkey four, five, is a six, little bit seven, more eight. He's, he's oh, a yeah, bit it's, more, it's, um, it's, it's nine him. to 15, so it's not as bad as what I thought it was. Nine, hold on, let me see. One, two, three, four, yeah, five, he's, he's six, going on. Oh, nine. Yeah, yeah, it is a nine, yeah. But he does have a lot of spots on pay per views, that's what I'm noticing. It's just, like, it's the just nine, recently, four of them are I think it's because so recently thing, he's, yeah. I think recently it's because he's fought a lot more recently and McDesi mm. has been inactive, so it seems like. He's br bridged the gap a lot because of that. Right. Because because he hasn't fought that much in the last couple of years. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, he does take yeah, a little yeah, bit like, of a hiatus. Yeah, and then since then, Marlocki has started his UFC career and has fought a lot. And uh, th this was almost a tough fight because I do think McDesi has the power, and we've seen Marlocki get chin. But at the same time, Jamie Marlocki has a nice overall skill set, and he's – there's mm -hmm. been fights where he's showcased that greatly, and then there's other fights where he's kind of been so up much. and down, like kind of kind of raucous. <laughs> so like he has good power himself. He has good distance strike. And he's good in the clinch. He has knockout power. He has good uh cardio. His one weakness though is getting hit certain times and then getting I wouldn't say yeah. he, he has a glass chin, but there's certain times his defense yeah goes down because of how he fights. He puts it down to give himself extra. Uh, and it's, it's not all the time. He only does it sometimes. So if like you can pick up his pattern, you can guess uh, guess on those patterns and then get a good free shot on him. And that's what some of the guys have done. You saw in the last fight, that's what happened. He was, he was killing his uh, opponent, the last minute uh, replacement, and he guessed uh, the shot in the round two after getting annihilated the first uh, a round and a half, and he caught uh, Malarkey, and it changed the whole complexion of mm -hmm. that fight in, in his favor to get that uh, to get that uh, victory uh, by KO, just because of what he was doing in that fight and how like he, he got the tell. And sometimes it happens to Malarkey, sometimes it doesn't. I think Malarkey could win this one uh, by a late finish because I feel like. Like he's gonna have the more volume. He's gonna press the uh, the pace a little bit more. He's gonna be a little bit skittish of the 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 power of McDessie. So I feel like he's gonna be blocking his face more this fight. I feel like he's gonna be mm. more prepared for it. So he might he might take a little bit away uh, early of uh, like throwing for power, and he's gonna do a lot more damage. And he's gonna get up early, which is gonna cause McDessie. To have to come from behind and kind of leave himself open to throw in shots, and then that's where Malarkey would get that late finish. But, uh, um, I, I think it, I could see it either way, honestly. Yeah. Like I think they're so close in their styles. They both yeah. have fairly well-rounded skill sets. McDessie does have a power advantage, but he's not finishing dudes. Last dude he's finished was uh oh boy, I gotta scroll. Shane Campbell back in 2015. Yeah. That was his last finish. He has been winning by decision, and some of these names are impressive, the most notable being Ignacio Mahamundes. Um, but it, Ignacio Mahamundes wasn't like – I think that's what cost him is that he's not as well-rounded yet. I also, he's mostly just but, but, uh, So he doesn't have as many threats as they're out there. And Malarkey it, does. And then, it worries, and then it worries me that he lost to Francisco Trinado, uh yeah, yeah. a month beforehand – no, no, a year beforehand yeah. – uh, which it's like you can beat Bob Mondes, but you can't beat Francisco beat Trinado. Trinado yeah. And then weird. you come off of that Bob Mondes uh, split decision win. And then uh, five months later, I mean, a year and a half later, you beat, I mean, you lose to Nazareth. That's his last fight is Nazareth yeah, no, over, yeah. over a year ago to the state. So, and then before that, he beat Pinedo, Pearson, and Abel Trujillo. Uh, mm -hmm. Before getting knocked out by a weird kick in 2016 by Lando Vernada, yeah. uh, yeah. a grappler. Yeah. So that <laughs> that that's something. Even though that was seven years ago, that still questions me that you get finished by a grappler by a wheel kick. Yeah. Uh, in well, round one, it's it's a little weird because like I could see McDessey maybe getting a decision here if yeah. he's able to use his experience just like he did with Bahamundes. 
to just manage malarkey because malarkey is mm -hmm. not going to be the one who is initiating wrestling exchanges no. that's not going to be him that's that's not his, his but wheelhouse. he does have but he does have good takedown defense that's why he I does like yeah malarkey. no i don't think mcdessie's going to be hunting for takedowns i think he's just no. going to want to pin him on the cage and burn him out i think if yeah. mcdessie can find a balance between just standing and trading a little bit stinging with big shots and then pin him on the cage and burn him out he could steal rounds that way um, but then Malarkey, on the other hand, could just outpoint him. He could out volume. Yeah. He could maintain that distance. This is this would be a good fight. To, this would be a good fight to watch live and then live bet yeah, after round one. That, this would be the one. perfect yeah. one to do so. You got sure. the odds, which are basically almost 50 50 as you can get within a fight like this, minus 190, 155. And then whoever it swings, you just look at that live. Say Malarkey goes to round one and round one. Maybe look at McDesi. If McDesi wins it, you might go McDesi anyway because he was already a favor and you, it might swing. It, it just all depends on how your eyes look at round one and how they both are looking coming into round two. Uh, but this definitely would be a good option for live bet. It's just, like you said, they're very close. I'm just edging with Malarkey. I know McDesi has the more experience in the UFC, but lately I feel like it's been Malarkey. And I like the competition Malarkey has fought of late compared to uh, McDesi because McDesi, had, like in the five year span, he's fought once every year and a half. And I feel like active, that's a yeah. long time in, in, in between, whereas Jamie. Morlocky is less than that. If you look at uh, Morlocky, he's far. Uh, uh, last time he, he fought in J June, uh, he fought in February, he fought in last July, and then Turner was uh, March. It's every three, four months he's fighting. He's at least mm. fighting at least twice a year, possibly three. So he's staying active, even though you're losing. He's staying active, and he stood to that point to where he could got like he he wins two, and then he loses one. He wins two, and then he loses one, and then or whatnot. Like the Riddell one, he definitely lost. Ferris Zeman, I felt like he won that because he he took down Zeman four times, and it was just one of those fluke ones. Uh, Turner definitely beat him, and then he was dominated. Nine Naimov and the Naimov caught him at the end, so it could have been Ryan Ryan on a three fight win streak there if he didn't get caught, and that's why okay. he's in the position that he's in now. So okay. I still like him edging this fight out uh, in this one. I'm saying either way, like these guys yeah. are very closely matched. Uh, this is probably one of the this is the second most interesting fight in the entire prelim yeah. card right here. <laughs> let's let's move on to the next prelim one. We got a featherweight matchup between Jack Jenkins versus Chepe Mariscal. We got Jenkins, who's the minus two twenty favorite, and then we got Mariscal, who's the plus one seventy five underdog. Uh, what are your thoughts on this one? So I'm not gonna lie, I accidentally forgot to do this one. Like it wasn't even in my list for some reason. I don't know how I missed it, but. I've been eyeballing their records, just doing a little research in the background while you've been talking. Um, and right now it looks like Jack Jenkins, even though – isn't he a – oh, I don't see his affiliation. Is he a city kickboxing guy or is he from somewhere else? I think he trains with them from time to time, but he's not yeah. – I mean, he's out of Victoria, Australia. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think he trains yeah. primarily somewhere else, and then he works with them for maybe like a week or two. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Because, I mean, he definitely has hands for sure. Five KOs. He has a couple submission victories, but he hasn't had one in a long while. Like, it's been a minute since he choked someone out. Last time he choked someone out was 2019. Or, no, I'm sorry, 2020. After that, knockout. Uh, win by a TKO. A decision. Another TKO. Two decisions. So, he's been streaking for a while, and it seems like he... Definitely would prefer to stand and trade, but he does have the ability to grapple when he absolutely needs to. Um, and he is riding a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine fight win streak. Three of those, uh, well, two of those inside the UFC, one of them is a contender series fight. Um, and then Mariscal, it seems like his background would lend to him being a better grappler than anything. Like you see early in his career, um, he has like some uh, pretty impressive. Uh, submissions and then he's got a couple of knockouts in there 
Like his record looked more well-rounded, but then as you get closer to like when he gets into LFA, Cage Warriors, um, he starts to really kind of be more one note. Like he wants to stand and trade more. So it doesn't seem like he is. He kind of fell in love with the punching, I think is what happened there. Um, and that kind of made his record a lot more spotty. He has more knockouts, like more knockout losses as well, which tells me his defense is probably not always 100%. He seems like he's a bit more of a brawler. Um, when you get the some of these Brazilian guys with the Muay Thai, that does happen where they yeah. just kind of step forward and they will trade one and eat one and, you know, it gets a little crazy in there. So, I mean, in terms of, like, technique, overall balance, I feel like Jack Jenkins seems like the better pick here. I think there's a reason why he's striking the way he is, and I think part of that is, yes, he is good at striking, but he's also able to balance it with the other skills when he needs to because sometimes you need to pull that ripcord and use your wrestling because if you get rocked, you need to get him to stop punching you somehow, and wrestling is usually the more effective option for that because it makes him tired, gives you time to recover, and then it puts you in the driver's seat. So once you're good, then you can separate and go back to striking, whereas I think with Mariscal, he's going to be with a brawler. He's going to want to walk in and just throw haymakers and just trade, um, and I think Jenkins will be able to m- more effectively manage that with the balance of striking wrestling, whereas Mariscal, I think, you know, it, it's – I think with his defense is going to be an issue, especially with what it looks like Jenkins likes to do is kind of keep a certain range until he needs to, and then change to wrestling. Whereas it looks like Mariscal with the brawling, it, you know, it puts him in as much danger as it puts the other guy. So I think the more technical balanced fighter is probably going to be the one that shines here. Um, So just eyeballing it. I, I could see why Jenkins is a minus 220 favorite makes sense. Um, but yeah, I don't know too much about this because I am just now researching on the fly. So that's the most basic analysis I've got. You you watched Chepe Mariscal's last fight against Trevor Peak, and it, it's kind of similar fight as this one, except for the fact that Trevor Peak puts a lot of power and in, into his strike, and he puts a hundred percent into it. So yeah. he was hitting around Chepe very well, and then Chepe would just go into the clinch stop him, stop his momentum. And then by round two, Trevor Peak was getting slow and getting slow. And then that's when Chepe Mariscal was able to take over because Peak was getting tired. And then he was able to get the uh, get, get the finish there because of the, uh, just because of how the reach of Mariscal and the fact that he had better cardio and Peak just tired himself out going for the kill in round mm-hmm. one. Jack Jenkins is a dynamic striker. He has great hand speed. He has underrated calf kicks that he throws. But the big thing with him is a lot of his fights go to distance because he doesn't put 100% into his striking. He dials it down to 60 to 70%. It allows him to attack his opponent without tiring out so he can last all three rounds. He attacks the whole body. He attacks the head. He attacks the stomach. He throws a lot of uh, body, uh, body shots. And then he does the leg kicks, which the, they hurt a lot. And then he did have that questionable uh, decision victory over Jamal Emers, but it was because of how he was attacking him. He was the one uh, primarily going at Emers, and Emers wasn't able to get the the ground game going, the, the grapple. And that's uh, a big thing with Jenkins. He has great takedown defense. So the, the grapple with Chevy Mariscal is going to get kind of known fight, so then it becomes a strike-in. And when you look at Trevor Peak, who was landing a lot on Mariscal and then mm-hmm. tied himself out, Jack Jenkins is going to throw a lot at him with less power, and it's going to allow him to do it even longer. That's why you see, if you look at uh, the, the history of Jack Jenkins, a lot of his fights go to decision. And it's because of that. He sacrifices the finishes and the power to allow him to attack his opponent over time, and he can get finishes. It's just that sometimes he doesn't, and then he brutalizes his opponent by damage, and then it's basically a clear-cut 30 to 27, 29, 28 for him, usually in fights. Like, it's going to – I feel like you're going to get a motivated Jack Jenkins coming off of that questionable win over Jamar Emers, and he's fighting a guy in Chepe Mariscal who's not as – uh, ideal as Jamal Emers was coming into that fight, which ironically was in Australia as well. Jack Jenkins, uh, one of his last fights. 
uh, before the Jacksonville one. So I got Jack Jenkins win this one by decision. I think he's going to pour, pour in more volume. He's going to be able to defend the takedowns very well, as he always does. And keep an eye on those cap kicks. So those are going to play a big factor in this one against a guy like Chepe Mariscal. I think he's going to get him off of his game, and it should be a pretty easy victory for Jack Jenkins. I know he's the minus 220 uh, favor in this one. If you look at Jack Jenkins to win by decision, it's plus 130. Uh, you look at KO, it's plus 250. You look at submission, it's plus 1800. So it's very high up there. Uh, uh, if, if you do inside the distance, it's plus 225. It's just hard for me uh, to go with uh, like a finish in this one because you look. Decision win uh, by split over Emmers. He beat Don Chanis by a unanimous decision. His play in the contender series was around three ground and pound against Lonares. But then he has decision, a leg kick victory. Uh, he has a punch in knees round two, a choke, a rear naked choke, choke, armbar. Uh, the two losses that he's had early are by submission. And then he, he has a lot of finishes early, but not recently. And he's kind of changed up his game plan uh, from those losses. So I like, I could see him winning by uh, by inside the distance. I just feel more comfortable with the the decision one, knowing what I've seen lately from him in the last two, three years. It's him dialing back on the power and pushing up more of the volume and overall attack on the ground. I mean, on the, on the body shots and on the head. And it allows him to last longer and allows his speed to stay up at 100%. So I'm going with Jack Jenkins in this one by decision. And I think winning by decision is the right thing. I have to go with from like just the latest things. And it's at plus 130. So you still get him at plus odds for that one. Because I just think unless you wait until the morning of – yeah. I really don't think you could go with minus 220 unless you do it live and then you hope Chepe wins round one. That's the only yeah. hope with that. Yeah. No, I believe you. Let's I move just read all on. this like two seconds ago. <laughs> yeah. Let's move on to the prelim main event that we have for you. We got the light heavyweight matchup between Carlos Erberg versus Da Un Jung. You got another city kickboxer and Carlos. He comes in at minus my, my 225 favorite mark. And then Da uh, Jung is coming in as the plus 225 underdog status. Uh, what are your thoughts on this prelim main event? I mean, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, when you look at um, Da Eun Young, most of his knockouts, I think, kind of already happened. Like when he came into the UFC, he was on something of a tear. Weirdly enough, he tied, like had a draw with Sam Elvey of all people. I'm not sure how that happens, but it was a draw split decision sort of situation. Um, he was able to edge out William Knight. Very impressive considering the power differential there. Um, he was able to knock out uh, Kennedy and Juku. Uh, but then he's on a two loss, uh, yeah, two loss streak right now. Got knocked out by Dustin Jacoby, which... Jacoby's not really the knockout guy. He's more the decision guy. And then you got Devin Clark winning by decision. That one makes a little more sense. Um, but yeah, I think with Da Eun Jung, I think, you know, he's now that he's inside the UFC, he's going to start slowing down a little bit now that he's coming up, up against like actual like top 15, top 10 talent. Because we're looking here at, uh, what is this, light heavyweight? Light heavyweight is really only stacked when you get to the top 15. Below that, there's just, I don't know, the, the, the competition is, there's like a drop off once you pass that number 15 marker and things just don't, things are not even close, right? So that's why like rising stars like Carlos, uh, Carlos Ullenberg or Ullenberg, um, I think this is going to be just another stepping stone for him because he's already demonstrated he's a cut above that like bottom 15 competition, like 15 to the bottom division. He's been pretty much just yeah. putting people away with the exception. I'm just going to call it. Uh, I'm just going to nickname him. I'm going to nickname him Iceberg. That's what I'm going to nickname go. him. Now. That's actually going <laughs> to be a good one. But I mean, yeah, he's put away. Um, uh, oh, God, I can never say his name. Nigo Murianu. 
I think I got it right. Uh, uh, Nicolay Nicolay Negromano. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, he also took out uh, Nchukwi, um, and then Kenny a bunch of Chukwu. other like less known. Yeah, Tafon. Yeah, yeah he took him out. Uh, he did lose to Kennedy in Chukwu, but that was the only time he lost. Um, mm. But I mean, yeah, he's been on on something of a tear, and I don't really see anything in Da Unjung that would be like a big threat to him. Da Unjung, um, he's a big boy, but I think Carlos yeah. Olberg still has the power advantage for sure. I think if there's a knockout happening, it's probably favoring Olberg over uh, Unjung. Um, I don't see a whole lot of Unjung outside of that. Like he has like two dis- submissions, a couple of decisions. Those I think both have come inside the UFC. But yeah. like you know, he's not a big wrestling threat either. So it's not like he could slow down Olberg with like a big wrestling threat, like you know, uh, uh, like Rachmanov or something in the heavyweights or even in the in the light heavies. You know, right there you've got uh, uh, let's see. Oh, Dominic Reyes has fallen really far. Jeez. Like Khalil Roundtree's pretty well rounded. We saw some decent grappling out of Ryan Spann his last time out. Vulcan Uzdemir also showed off some new wrestling skills working with uh, um, uh, Cosmot and the boys over there yeah. in Sweden. So, like, now this division, once you get to that top 15, that's where you get more of the balance here. Uh, but Dalton Jung, I don't think, has that balance. I think he's mostly just hands. And if it's just hands against hands, I think Willenberg has a huge advantage yeah. there. And he's probably just going to – it's just going to be a matter of who catches who. But I like Ullenberg's technique. He's a little cleaner. He's more precise. Um, and he can really deliver a lot of power very, very quickly. So I think Ullenberg is probably going to get a finish here. Uh, historically, he's been trending towards – it looks like first-round finishes primarily. Um, Daun Jung looks like he's a little bit more experienced. So we could maybe see like a late first, early second-round finish somewhere in there. Yeah, if you look at both of them, uh, they both have a common opponent in Kenny and Chekwu, uh, the, the, uh, where Alberg lost. I believe that that was actually his debut, where he, he threw over 100 strikes in the first round and a half, and then got caught in round two against yeah. uh, Chekwu and was knocked out. But he was dominating him before. I mean, he just yeah. he, he got started way too fast. And ever since then, he's kind of monitored yeah, his yeah. output yeah. striking-wise. And it's been a lot better for him. He didn't just blow everything out in the first round like he did against Kenny. Whereas Da Jung beat Kenny and Chekwu in round one by a standing elbow. And it's because he was, he was able to get Kenny backing up into the clinch where he threw the elbow, he was able to limit the space that Kenny and Chekwu was doing. But then afterwards, of course, he goes and uh, gets knocked out by Dustin Jacoby in three minutes, and then he loses by decision to Devin Clark because of the grappling. And when you look at Alberg, it's been primarily his striking, managing his striking, winning. He's won ever since then, and he's kind of looked really good good doing so he has the speed he has the the movement he has the power and we've seen and he's kind of like you you look at the kickboxing background you got to look at that dustin jacoby fight and and seeing what he did to don jung he was able to just catch him uh with the distance he was throwing good volume and that's what you're going to see a better version of that with arberg because he has the finishing capabilities where we thought uh, Jacoby didn't have it. And then Jacoby finishes him. Jacoby just got a finish in his last fight, and we're starting to see more of that from Jacoby uh, more lately. And I, I see this as a round one finish for Carlos Erberg. I think he has he has the tools to do so. We we've seen lately. He fooled me once. He fooled me twice. You you tie to Sam Alvey. You get knocked out by Justin Jacoby, and then you yeah. barely. Uh, it can uh, you barely lose to Devin Clark in a too close of a fight where he's it has been fighting the, uh, the the same way since then, and then before that he he gives the decision to William Knight who can barely cut weight now and has to fight heavyweight now because of the issues that he's having there. So it's like, uh, like is it just something defensively that he's not getting uh, going with because he Da Jung has the power. We've seen that just like mm-hmm. I said in the in Czech Wu fight. It's just that he hasn't been able to do it defensively. And if he can't do it defensively, he's going to have loads of problems with a guy like Arberg 
who has that dynamic. I think he might be if you if you take away Volkanovski and and you take away Adesanya, this is the third best guy in that. I feel like in that camp, and that's saying something with Kai Car France there. I think this is the third best yeah. guy out of that group because he has the size, he has the reach, he has the the striking out point, and he has the finishing capabilities uh, to do all of that. Uh, and, and if you look at the average strikes per minute, it's it's up there. Like he throws uh, in the same amount. And if you look at the Arberg by KO, it's at minus 165, which is a very generous bet there uh, for you knowing that the majority of his fights are going to be finished in round one and by KO because that's primarily what he does. And if you look at the output that he's done in the past – uh, in all of his fights, you really haven't seen much because he he, he beat Bruno Oliveira by on uh, Dana White by KO. He loses to uh, Kenny and Check Rue round two, but he still threw over 150 strikes in that fight before getting clipped. Uh, he beat Baby and Surratt by decision round three, but he had 70 strikes and then he had two takedowns. Mm-hmm. And then he had more strikes uh, added on from clinch. He just wanted to outshow his grappling side of things. He knocked out Teppin round one a minute in. He knocked out Nicolay round one three minutes in. And then he knocked out Ehor Pateria two minutes in. So he's on a three-fight knockout streak uh, since that Fabian Surratt victory so he's rocking a four fight win streak with three the last three being by ko so i think he continues that ko streak i think he yeah. does it in round one and he makes it look easy so i got carlos urberg round one knockout i like the yeah. knockout uh prop at minus uh at the minus one uh 65 mark very generous there and you just gotta look at the 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 history with him, if you take away him getting knocked out by Kenny and Chekwu because he blew himself the first round and a half, he should have he dominated that fight and, and won by at least decision. It's just that he tired himself out and Kenny took advantage with that one punch that he had. And maybe it was a good thing because maybe he needed that to learn the fact that he, he can't just start out hot like he usually does. And he allowed himself to be more patient. So maybe it was a, a blessing in disguise for him. Yep. Another easy one. Yep. Let's move on to the main card. We got a fight, five fight main card. Uh, the first fight on, on the belt is a late heavyweight matchup between Tyson Piedro versus Anton Tokali. Uh, we got Pedro, who's the minus 130. Favorite, we got Anton Takari, who's the plus 110 underdog. Uh, what are your thoughts on this main card opener? Okay, first off, Anton Takali, my man. The the moniker, the pleasure man, that's not it. Pick a different name. That's You sound like a gigolo, not an MMA fighter. What the hell is that? First of all, like I just I got to say something about that. That's crazy. But in terms of their skill level, I think this is another like kind of open and shut one here. Um, I think what we primarily see with Tyson Pedro is kind of like a good balance of, of uh, skills here. He does like to stand and trade because he does have a pretty decent amount of power. Uh, but his record's a little bit weird. Like when he came into the UFC, he beat Khalil Roundtree, big name. Beat Paul Craig, another big name. But at the time, Paul Craig was using that basically like you know, I, I let you into my front guard and either I submit you or I get finished or I lose the decision. Like there was no other third, like fourth outcome. Like that's all it was for Paul Craig. So in this particular case, he got finished. Um, and then like he had a couple of losses against Lahir Latifi, OSP and, and like uh, Shogun Rua, but 2018 Shogun Rua, like on his way out of, of the door, like on retirement. So that's very interesting three losses there. I'm not sure what was happening to him in like 2017, 2018. And then he took a long break, came back in 2022, got on a bit of a uh, of a winning streak again. He beat Ike Villanueva, uh, Harry Hunsucker, both by knockout in the first round. Um, and then he got stopped by uh, Bukakis 
Um, that one was a decision, but he was actually competitive for a lot of that fight. I think uh, part of it was the gas tank. Part of it was not executing a good strategy. I think there was just a, like a number of issues in that fight, but it wasn't like Bukakis made it look easy. Like it, he was still competitive in that fight for sure. Um, so I think uh, with uh, Pedro, he has definitely got a good mix of skills. He's got plenty of power when he needs it. He's pretty decent at wrestling, knows his way around the ground when he's on the mat, uh, especially to keep himself out of danger. That's one thing that was impressive to me is when Bukakis was trying to finish him on the mat with submissions, he did manage to find his way out of some really tough spots and just keep the fight going. Um, and in some of those cases, he was actually able to get back in the driver's seat, not only escape the submission, but maintain the top position while doing so, which is impressive. And then you got um, over here the Pleasure Man. No, that's not it. He's a uh, kind of a newcomer. He had a decision victory in his Contender Series debut against, uh, oh God, Asiaco dos Santos. Um, then when he came in, he's been on a two fight losing streak. Now I will say one of those was against uh, Jilton Almeida. We're gonna give him a break on that one, okay? Like, like we all understand what was going on there. But the next fight, I think it's it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier with Blood Diamond, right? Got Jeremiah Wells' first time out, got obliterated. And they're like, all right, let's give him someone a little easier. That way he has more ability to show his skills. And that's what I think they were thinking with uh, Vitor Petrino. I think they were thinking, you know, this guy, you know, he's you know pretty mid. I think if we give him someone a little easier, maybe he'll do better because he did pretty decent on the Contender Series. So we're hoping for a repeat of that. We want an encore performance. So let's dial down the talent a little bit. That way he's got a shot and not give him a monster like Almeida first time out, right? So, but the problem was, is, you know, he kind of came out and he showed, I don't want to say well-roundedness because there were some deficits for sure. Like you could just look at the stats. The stats pretty much tell the story how that fight went. The striking was pretty close. Um, Petrino did edge him out, but he had more significant strikes thrown at 82 versus uh, Tolkaj's 56. But in terms of what landed, 59 to 33. But the grappling is very interesting here. Seven. Six minutes of control time. Six minutes and 13 seconds on the official stats website. But that's a crazy amount of time. But what's even crazier, uh, Tolkaj did have some control time, four minutes, but he had five of 15 takedowns five out of 15 he got stuffed 10 times 10 times and then, they were and like, then, not today and, and then petrino took him down seven times seven out of nine and out of nine so he only missed twice that's an yeah. excellent rate so it seems like tokaji has like the basics of grappling down like he's got yeah. the basic wrestling kind of like uh, um um in ganu in the serial gan fight he wasn't doing anything crazy. He was just showing like, hey, I know basic wrestling. Like I know the positions. I know the transitions. I know more or less how to stop a takedown. I feel like that's roughly the skill lover Tol Tolkaji is by at way, when it comes to like by the, the way, in the Dana way, by the way, in the Dana Way Contender Series fight, uh, Anton had 11 takedowns. Oh, okay. Well, sometimes yeah. it works. But clearly, yeah. once you're in the UFC, again, there's a difference between the people who have been to the UFC and people yep. who have not. And now that he's in the UFC, he's fighting UFC caliber talent, especially with a guy like uh, Pedro, who has a lot of experience. He's been in here since 2016, and his overall record is about even. But remember, there was kind of a weird hiccup in that 2018 era. We took, like, was that three years off almost? And now yeah. that he's come back, he's sort of flipped the script on his on his streaks. He did come out against uh, Bukakis. Again, lost competitively, though. He was still in that fight. Um, but I think – I don't think Tokaji is going to bring the sort of competition that Bukakis brought. I don't see that in any way, shape, or form in terms of the grappling, in terms of the striking. It's just I don't really see a whole lot of threats to Pedro here. Uh, because it seems like now that the pleasure man has gotten to the UFC, it's a little bit more than he can handle. Like he was doing pretty well back when he was fighting in like brave FC. Like if you look at his, his record before he enters the UFC, nearly flawless. He only lost an yeah. exhibition grappling match to Alexander Gustafson. Only loss he had mm -hmm. otherwise really good. And then as soon as he hits the UFC, obviously got obliterated by Almeida, but even like the undercard talent that like, you know, sub 15 unlisted talent, it doesn't seem like he's able to quite 
you know, match uh, the way he was able to in sub UFC talent. So I think it, Pedro will, uh, Ty, pff, Pedro Wilson, Tyrone Pedro is, is probably going to be able to make pretty easy work of him um, because he's been favoring the hands recently. I think he's probably going to be hunting for the knockout. Um, but it just depends on how many failed takedown attempts Turkaji has. I think he is going to try to wrestle with him, try to tire him out a little bit. But, I mean, uh, Pedro was keeping up with uh, Bukakis, who is a pretty solid wrestler, and he was keeping it competitive. So I think he's got more than enough to keep it on the feet. And he did keep that. Keep himself out of danger. With, yeah. And we've seen in the past he did that with uh, Paul Craig. Who he did, yeah. He's tour- another amazing grappler, yeah. So, I mean, his grappling skills are 100% there. So I think he has what it takes to keep this fight where he wants it. If it's in a wrestling situation, it's because he thinks he's hunting for a takedown and maybe a little ground and pound, something like that. But otherwise, I think he wants to stand and trade with him, which I think Tokaji will oblige. I think that would be the preferred method for him, considering like how many his, his knockout to submission ratio. Five knockouts, two submissions. Seems like he likes to trade a little bit. But if he trades yeah. with Pedro, I think he's gonna get he's gonna get laid out because I think the power differential is all on Pedro's side, and there isn't really like a a grappling or wrestling background to help him out if Pedro stuns him and hurts him badly. I don't think he's got what it takes to really slow Pedro down in any significant way. I think Pedro will just be like, "Oh, cool, it's a wrestling match now. Let me throw you to the ground, and then I'll do some ground and pound." Like I don't see too many obstacles here, so I think either Pedro can win by a finish. Probably knockout. Um, I saw him kind of start a little slow against Bukakis, so it'd probably be later, maybe second, third mm-hmm. round. Or at that same token, just if it ends up being more of a wrestling match, um, I still think he could uh, win by decision just in the control time. Like he could get another seven minutes up on the board against this guy. So, By the way, fun fact, him and yeah, Pedro and his brother-in-law are fighting on this card, both on the main no, card. No shit. And his brother, his brother-in-law is Ty Tori Vasa. Really? No way. I didn't know that. It's cool. They're both, he's married to uh, Tori Vasa's, I think it's his, uh, Ty Tori Vasa's sister. I think that's how it is. Oh, interesting. It's either that or okay. other way around. I know they're brother-in-laws and they both train together. Right. So, uh, which I thought it was very cool. So they, have, so they do have a lot that's of the similar cool. background with that, but I, I'm chucking off his loss to uh, Modestus Bukakis as just like a blip in his uh, record. Like he he didn't come in looking at like the same guy that won by first round knockout the last two fights. And on top of it, from what we saw from Modestus when he got cut to when he got uh, brought back up into that fight, it's a totally different fighter uh, for Modestus Bukakis. He came in more aggressive. He was more moving forward. He wasn't hanging back. It was a totally different fight. And I don't think Tyson Piedro expected that out of him. And he still was in that fight. And he was still uh, like competing in it. And he, it, to me, he lost it two to one. But we didn't expect that type of uh, Modestus to come in there and be as aggressive as he did. So I, I like to chalk that off as like a uh, he surprised me type of fight. Like... Mm-hmm. More so than uh, Tyson Page are losing, but coming into this one, we know Anton's going to favor the grapple, and we really haven't seen too much of the striking from him from a heavy standpoint. He was he hit around in the very few spots that he had with Petrino, but he got worked over in the in the grapple. And Petrino kept on taking him down, even when uh, Anton took him down. Katrina would reverse position with him and then just crown and pound him. But when you look at it, Tyson Pedro has a very good takedown defense. He has snapping calf kicks that he's going to be able to use. He has knockout power. And on top of that, he has sneaky jiu-jitsu uh, and submission game. We've seen that. I think he's one of the few people to be able to submit Paul Craig. In that fight, I believe it, it, he was able he to won by knockout, but yeah, he, he was able to lock this. Uh, then it was somebody else, but he did have a lock on him, and then he won by knockout. But I know he had that one second the submission uh victory in the past. I'm looking it up now. Paul Craig or uh, Pedro? Oh, um, Pedro, he it was, was uh, it was round tree, it was round tree. That's it. No, it was a clear round tree. He won by oh, that too. Yeah. Oh, he has two yeah. inside the UFC. My bad. 
He also has one against yeah. a, a Spur, a Perbeck Saravov. Yeah, it was like Saperbeg, his Saperov. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Saperov. yeah, he won yeah, by I can't he won names. by uh, Kamora. Yeah, and yeah. then of course, uh, so he has those two. But I, I, was, I felt like that was sooner than what it was, and it was his debut. Mm-hmm. Which always yeah. catches me by surprise because he's been there for a long time. It's just that yeah. he was out two or three years in, due to yeah. injury to his leg. But I feel like he's going to be able to, to defend the takedown, get the striking going. And I wouldn't be surprised if he knocks him out in round one or two. I'm going to say round two because I feel like Anton might get stunned and then he might clinch up with him just enough to hold him against the cage to keep himself going for a little longer. So I'm going to go with round two knockout. Uh, if you go Tyson Piedro by KO, TKO, DQ, it's plus 275. So they're giving you crazy good odds on it. And as of right now, actually, this fight is actually a 50-50 fight. They're both minus 110 wow. on Ben odds right now. So technically, you're going to get better odds on the current odds than you are on this one that I got from last night. So, like, to be honest... Go with the money line at minus 110. Go with the KO, TKO at plus 275. And you're going to be golden because unless Anton Takari can get the, the, the takedowns and get the ground game going, I feel like he's going to get pieced up in the stand-up game because we really haven't seen anything from him stand-up-wise other than he can take the fight to the ground and ground and pound you. And you didn't see that much against Petrino, which you thought you would have saw a little bit more from him in that one, so I really don't feel comfortable on the Anton side, and I'm, le- I'm leaning heavily with Tyson Piedro by early finish. Yep, that was an easy one. Yep, let's move on to the next fight on the card. We got a heavyweight battle between Justin Tapa versus Austin Lane. This is a rematch from a fight a couple months ago <laughs> that ended in. No contest, and I believe it was in Jacksonville by eye poke where Austin Lane got inadvertently eye poked by accident, and that's why they ruled it by no contest. But Justin uh, Taffa comes in as the minus 240 favorite, whereas Austin Lane comes in at the plus 195 underdog. What are your thoughts on this heavyweight battle? Man, this is like pretty much a dead even heat. They're both big boys swinging hammers. There's no grappling threat. There's none of that. There's not. There's just big boys swinging hammers. Like Austin Lane, he has one submission. He's not hunting for takedowns anytime soon. Justin Taffa, same thing. He's got no submit uh, submission victories at all. No submission losses either. But like his only losses have either come by knockout or decision. That's pretty much it. So these two big dudes are going to go in there and they're just going to throw heat. And with both of them, a lot of their wins come by first round because oftentimes once you get out of the first round, that's when you start to kind of gas out a little bit. You start to slow down. Uh, For example, um, uh, Austin Lanes has only seen a second round, let's see, one twice. He's only seen the third round once. So Tafa in that regard does have a little more experience. However, Every time he gets out of the, yeah, every time inside the UFC he's gotten out of the first round, he has lost the fight by decision. Uh, the one was uh, Carlos Felipe, and the other one was uh, Jared Vandera. Um, he did have uh, two second round knockouts. That was back in XFC, so it was a smaller league. It was also a while ago at this point, so I don't think that really matters. Um, so this, I think this fight is probably going to be decided in the first round. You know, this is the classic two knockout artists go and we just see who gets lucky. And with these guys, you know, it's it's going to be a big part of luck. Who gets the bigger shot first? Who gets stunned first? That's going to be a big part of it because, like, they're both powerful dudes. They could both shut the lights off at any second. If I had to guess, I would say Austin Lane has a little bit more of a power advantage because he's younger. He's big as shit. He was a football player, so he's he's in really, really good shape. Justin Toff is a big boy too, but most of that is fat. You look at his body composition, he knows how to throw his mass around, which makes him very, very powerful. But Austin Lane has like big ass muscles that can produce a lot of work and a lot of power. So if I had to give a power advantage, I would say Austin Lane there. Um, However, Austin Lane's kind of like one of those weird cases where like he's kind of like the better version of Greg Hardy. 
Greg Hardy yeah. was the experiment to see, can we move NFL players into a UFC? With Greg Hardy, we couldn't do it. Couldn't make it out. Gave him every opportunity. Couldn't fucking do it. Um, but he actually lost to Greg Hardy, weirdly enough, in his, his contender series debut. Yeah. Um, but then he had some pretty decent, you know, undercard experience. I see Fury FC, LFA, and then some shit I don't recognize. Uh, but then he came back, won his second time out on the contender series against Ricker Jacoby. And now, of course, you know, he's making up for his debut. So, I mean, we'll see. Um, I, I think this is still a dead even heat because, again, it, it's, it, you can't really tell who's going to get lucky, who's going to be just a half second slower, who's going to be just out of reach, just in reach. I think people are favoring Lane because of the youth advantage, because of the like the mus- musculature, the strength advantage. Um, I think because he has that NFL background, if he needs to, he can like kind of grind it out, but it is kind of a different gas tank than just running and tackling, you know, like it, it's a very diverse, you have to have multiple gas tanks in order to compete in MMA, whereas NFL, you know, you run, but it's in like shorter stints. So again, just in top is not really that effective once he leaves the first round either way. So I think if this, we're going to have a dynamite first round, if it goes to the second round, it's going to be boring as shit because they're both going to be gassed and they're going to be exhausted. And then if it goes into the second round, I could see Taffa maybe edging out a decision just because he's been in those later rounds. So he can navigate those a little bit more effectively. Whereas with Lanes, he's only been to a second round once or twice and then a third round one time in his whole career. So I don't think he has the, necessarily the gas taken. I think he's probably going to blow his wad in the first round. So if it makes it to the second, he's going to be too tired to really put up any sort of coherent offense. So, again, first round, absolute dead heat. Anything after the first round, probably Tafa. That's probably why, you know, he's getting the, the big 240 odds there. But I, I, this should be a pick em, like a straight pick em. I got Justin Tafa by first round knockout. I think he gets it done. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. This is a fight that's going to end in round one. I felt like Justin Tafa was starting to figure out Austin Lane. And he was laying some big shots on him before the eye poke even happened. And now he has even more time to use what he saw there to kind of catch what Austin Lean was doing to him early because now Austin Lean can't surprise him as much because right. they've already far and he was already starting to use that aggressiveness and the, the speed against Justin Tapa. And it's more time to prepare for a guy like that. Whereas Justin Tapa has the experience in the UFC, he has the power. He might not have the the speed and the quickness, but he's definitely going to have the hands, the hand uh, uh, advantage over him. And then you got the fact that they're coming in in uh, Australia, uh, where Justin Tapa trains. I think he's going to come in and want to prove a point uh, here. And so I like him by knockout, like like you said. One of, the, one of these guys is going to uh, get the win in round one. I think it's Justin Tafa. Yeah. And even though he's minus 240, when you look at it, to win by KO, it's 210, minus 210. But there's a certain prop that I really like. It's to win by KO in the first three minutes, either oh, fighter. <laughs> either fighter to win in that's the first good three one. Yeah, minutes. That's a good one to have for this one. <laughs> that's like the prop bet. Yeah. Plus 200. Dang, that's that's pretty really okay. Yes, it, yeah, and the sure prop reads the, the prop reads the prop reads either fight or win by KO TKO in the first three minutes of round one. That's a bet. easy, yeah, uh, and then it, no or if or or if the fight to be won in the fourth minute of any round, which is crazy, plus three hundred. Okay, that could even oh, that could even be <laughs> one like right right there. I mean, you could and double then, up on both of those, and you're good for the first round at least. <laughs> either fight or the win in the first two minutes of the fight plus three fifty. Like it just it just goes like, but that first one uh, plus uh, the the plus two fifty. Uh, I mean, the plus 200 for the first three minutes, that, that's perfect. That's a, a half a half round and a little bit more, half round and 30 minutes extra of time. And usually Justin Toffa gets things d- done in round one. And a lot of Austin Lane's fights are round one. So it's a recipe for uh, like a brawl and for somebody to get knocked out. And I think Justin Toffa started to crack the code in, in, in that fight. 
uh, in the second half of the fight before the eye poke. And I think he gets it done in this one. I don't, th- I don't think Austin Lean surprises, surprises him any more than he did in that one. So I got Justin Tapa by round mm-hmm. one uh, knockout. And I like the first three minute uh, victory prop for press 200 in this one since Justin Tapa is at minus 240. I think it's too high of a bet there. I think the only chance that you go for anything on this one is if you want to take Austin Lean. That's the only chance I feel like you have or any hope that the fight goes past round one and then Austin Lane wins round one, but then gets caught, say, late round one, and then mm. you see the tides turn. That's the only chance I think of anything else. I like Justin Tafa by KO in the first three minutes. That's the only prop that I like for this one. Yeah, no, that's that's a pretty cool prop bet actually, considering this this fight matchup. But that's an easy one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move right. on to the featured bout on this main card. Before we get going with that one, once again, we're changing names on the network. We're not the Bloodline Entertainment Network. So here's a little preview of what you're going to catch from this Saturday when we reveal the name of the network. We share the logo and we give you guys a little sneak peek into the future of the network. But check out this 10 second video that explains a lot of it. Once again, it's the same network, the same handle, just a new name and a new logo. So keep an eye out this Saturday for all of that. We're going to be going live to explain everything with that. Hang out, talk sports, discuss a lot of the name change. You know it. Just check it out on the network. You'll find it on the YouTube page, at the, the X page, and Instagram this Saturday, so keep an eye out for all that info right there. But let's dive into this featured bout on uh, UFC 293. We got a flyweight matchup between Manel Cape versus Felipe Dos Santos. Uh, Felipe is taking this fight on short news. So it's supposed to be Cape versus Kai Car France, and then Kai Car France mm. had the bear out of this fight. So Felipe is taking this fight on a couple weeks' notice. You got Cafe, who's the minus 370 favorite. You got Dos Santos, who is a protege of the shootbox gym. He is uh, coming in as the plus 290 underdog status. Uh, what are your thoughts on this featured bout? Yeah, uh, you know, you could be a protege of, like, you know, the best shootbox gym on the planet. I don't think it's going to make a difference if you are coming in on late notice against a guy like Cafe, who – that you need a training camp to prepare for this guy. Like he's pretty well rounded. He's got a good set of skills. I think the fact that he's coming in really late um, is is definitely putting Dos Santos behind the eight ball in a big way. But also, again, he hasn't been to the UFC. He hasn't experienced that talent pool yet. He's come close. He's he's touched the adjacent world with LFA. And of course, we do have a lot of LFA alumni coming into the UFC, and they end up being big names, but. Um, it is still UFC adjacent. It is not in the UFC, and it's definitely not in the UFC in the top freaking 10 of probably one of the, the most technical and difficult divisions to fight in at all. Like flyweights, you don't see a lot of like knockouts. Uh, that's why like Kai Kara France is sort of an anomaly. Usually at 125, it's very hard to generate the kind of power you need to just shut the lights off the way you can at like heavyweight, right? But at flyweight, They've got tons of energy. So it's constant movement. You have to be good everywhere. You have to know how to grapple. You have to know how to strike. You have to know how to wrestle. You have to know all the things because the pace is insane and you're using all those skills all the time, right? And that's a top 10 guy in that division. Now, mind you, the flyweight division is a little understacked right now. It's pretty much like like you got Cody Durden sneaking in there at number 15 now. So, you know. There's just not very many people in the flyweight division, so it's easy to advance, you know, Um, and the competition is in a stiff. I think maybe Dos Santos, I haven't seen anything from him. I just kind of know of his record, where he's from, who he trains with, that sort of thing. 
maybe if he gets like a proper int- introduction into the UFC, like an actual debut against like, you know, a, a usual gatekeeper like Ode Osborne's a, a pretty go-to guy for that sort of thing. And he can do well against Osborne. Yeah, I think he maybe has a spot in that top 15 somewhere, but that's a long way off. I don't think he's ready for number 10 in that division on like what, two weeks notice? No fucking shot. No shot. So like with Manuel Cape, um, he was preparing for what I think is probably infinitely harder opponent to deal with, which was Kai Car of France, who is, isn't he number five now? Number five. Yeah, he's number five. Um, for a reason, he's got really crazy power for a flyweight. Um, he's he's developing the grappling as he goes. Um, so that was set to be like a freaking dynamite match. But now I think it's going to be a bit more of a blowout. And look, I get why DeSantos did it. It's like you get the contract to the UFC. Even if you lose, that's still not like the worst thing in the world to happen. Like what happened with uh, Sean O'Malley and the guy who stepped in for him got punched in the face like 500 times and they had to stop the fight. What's his name? Chris, um, Chris Patino. Patino, that's right. He lost that fight, but he did get a contract after that because he showed a lot of heart. I think he was in for another three fights, pretty much on a three-fight losing streak. I think maybe he won one of them, um, and then he was out because like it was just it was a little outside of his reach. Yeah. So I don't know if Santos can put on a good fight because like for Patino that was the bantamweights. Bantamweights are as stacked, if not maybe more so than the lightweights. Like those are the two most competitive divisions right now. So I get why he washed out. There's just too much good talent in that division. Flyweight though is a little light, especially like that below yeah. 15 range, very light on talent. So he might, if he puts good heart into this fight, he, I don't think he's going to win that minus three seventies there for a reason, but we might be seeing him again. If he puts up a good fight, he puts on a show. He might show that he deserves to be in that bottom 15 to like bottom 30 area. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of a no lose situation other than like the loss on his record, but ultimately his career can only advance win or lose at this point. So I think it was a smart idea for Dos Santos, but he's got no shot at ultimately winning. I think Cape is just going to blow right through him. This kid is 22 years old. He debuted in 2019 and, and he, of course, He's won all of his fights. He did have one that went to no contest back in mm-hmm. 2021 <laughs> due to an accidental low blow. And then yeah. since then, he has uh, he has two decision wins and three submission victories. And then he hasn't fought since November of 2022 in LFA. His only mainstream fight was LFA. And ironically... He was in the main event of that where he beat Gabriel Santos. Uh, no, no, he, he, no, no. He was in the one of the. Uh, he was on the main card. My bad. There was like five, mm. five yeah, Santoses <laughs> on the card. I'm just trying to find out where he was on there. I'll find it later. I, I just oh he he yeah he was on he was the opening fight on the main card where he beat Hugo mm. Paeva right, by sense. decision. But he's primarily a jiu-jitsu grappler with a submission uh, background. That's going to be his uh, path to victory. He's going to use the long length uh, to throw strikes as he can. But he's definitely primarily a grappler in this one. He's coming in. He is uh, coming in 7-0. and But like I said, he's only, he's only been a pro since 2000. And 19, so it's not very long of a path. Whereas you got Manel Cape, who has an extensive boxing background, he did a, a lot of fights in Ryzen, making the move up in a tough Ryzen uh, like a roster before making the trick over to UFC. And then he kind of went through that, uh, that first couple fights law where. The big thing with Manel Cappy was he would start out slow around one and half around two yeah. and, and then come in and come in very strong the last half around two and round three and then ba- barely lose a fight by decision. You All you got to look is look at his debut. His debut fight was against Alexander Pantoja, yeah. the, the champion. Come on now. <laughs> and, and he competed with him and barely lost by decision two to one right. because he put it to Pantoja in round three. And then even uh, Nikolai um, uh, Matthew. Matthias Nikolai, yeah. 
was a split decision because of what he did round three and then the last half round fight. two. That was a good take, fight. Take, take away those. He knocked out Odie Osborne round one. He knocked out Zagas Zumaguov round one. And then he defeated David Dvorak by decision and still looked good doing that. And then since then, he's had literally a whole year of canceled bouts. He was supposed to fight Axe Prez in March, Davis and Figueredo in, in, in July, and then Kai Car France here. And all got canceled, and mm. then he was lucky to get a like a short nose fight with uh, Dos Santos in this one. I think he's going to be too quick with the striking. He's going to have decent takedown defense, and it's just uh, it's just going to be too soon for a guy like Felipe Dos Santos, who might develop into a top ten talent because he's vastly young and he's going to have all this time to develop and get in this fight early and might pay dividends later on. But Manel Cape is just, from a striking standpoint, he's just vastly better. Uh, he's going to be able to defend the takedowns, and I could see an easy uh, finish in round two or three. I'll give yeah. Dos Santos a round to be able to grapple with him to kind of limit uh, the damage. But he's going to be playing too much defense compared to offense, I feel like. And it's just yeah. a matter of time before Cape finishes him by KO because of his hand speed. He's just too quick. And he's too much of a finisher. And I'm excited to see when he actually gets a chance to fight somebody like Kai Car France or somebody else right. because of just seeing what he did against Pantoja. And now Pantoja is the champion now. Yeah. And like that, that just speaks volumes to me for him having that fight in his debut and to yeah. push uh, Pantoja in this hot one. I'm actually going to bring that up and look in that fight, which is kind of funny. Pantoja landed 74 strikes on him, and now Cappy landed 50. But then Cappy had two takedowns in that fight to zero of Pantoja. Uh, Pantoja had 25 round one to 12, then 29 to 16. But then Cappy outstruck him 22 to 20 in round three. It comes with the, the territory, of, like I said, early in his UFC. He started out slow, but now since then, he's kind of picked the aggression up uh, and he's kind of figured it out. And I think he's going to continue the streak uh, and trend that he's on after that losing streak. And I see him making the top five soon. This could be a guy that could challenge for the title and get that rematch. I just see it within him. I, I think he has that dog within him where he wants to – uh, showcase a lot of what he did in Ryzen. So I got no cap A by round two knockout. Yeah, it's an easy one. We can, yeah. Not yeah. <laughs> no, no. There's really not that many prop bets either on this one. Like, you really got to dig deep into this one. Like, Oof. either afraid to win in round one or two. Around one or three is minus one fifteen, and ER fighter win around two or three is plus one eighty five. So you're already like playing with fire on that one. The only one that seems juicy is either fighter win in the first three minutes of the fight, which is plus three twenty five. But it's so shoddy and so vague with that one because Cap A could get the knockout mm. in the end of the first round, and then you don't cash. So right. and his K and his KO prop is. Literally, him to win by KO is minus 200, so it's really not Oof, worth yeah. it there. So, you're better off just waiting live and hoping that Dosando has a good first, has a good <laughs> round, and then this goes down. That's yeah, really yeah. your only option here, or if you just take what they give you, but even then, it's minus 370, it's too high of a gap to work with. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and let's move on to the co-main event in the evening. We got a heavyweight battle between Ty Tuivasa versus Alexander right. Volkov. Uh, looks like the picture was <laughs> messed up that. going to this one. Uh, but we got Ty oh, Tuivasa, right. who's the plus 170 uh, underdog. And then you got Alexander Volkov, who's the minus 200 uh, favorite. What are your thoughts on this cool mean event? At least the guy has blonde hair. I'll give him that. All right. I was like, man, he's looking good. He got some new ink, but damn. Yeah. <laughs> he's looking awesome for late 30s. No. Yep. Uh, 
I mean, like, that's the thing about this matchup. Volkov is really a fighter you use as a gatekeeper. Because once you give him, like, you know, actual top five talent, he gets blown the fuck out of the water. Cyril Gaon, Tom Aspinall, Curtis Blades, Derek Lewis at the time when he was still, like, number, I think, two or three. Um, these are all the big names he's lost against besides, like, Oster Overheim, Walt Harris, uh, Marcin Tabura, Jorzinho Rosenstruck, he has beat, um, and, and Romanov recently, who was kind of surging. He has beat some big names, but those at the time were names that were like kind of in that t- uh, 15 to 10 range, and they were challenging to come up to the top five, and he just would like, kind of like swat them down. Whenever he tries to fight up to these bigger names like Blades, Aspen, or Gone, he's just outclassed. And a big part of that, when you look at the heavyweight division like three years ago, Big boy swinging hammers top to bottom, except for Volkov. He was like the one dude who was tall. He's like six, seven. He's uh, like 200 and I want to say 50, 60 pounds close to the divisional limit, but not hundred percent there. Um, but he's lean. He's fast. He has good striking. Um, he can grapple a little bit. The problem was he just wasn't very aggressive. That's the thing. He has a good, strong first round and that's where most of his activity happens. And it's not like he gasses out because he's still putting numbers up. He's just choosing not to be active at some point. It's mm-hmm. kind of like he's doing a counter game or something's going on there. But like his volume just drops off for like no reason. Cause like he'll have little spurts after that. In the first round, he'll have pretty consistent volume. He'll be finding those shots. Like a lot of these uh, wins against some of these names, Martian Tabura, Rosenstruck, Romanov. He finished Rosenstruck and Romanov both in the first round. Tabura, he took the decision. Uh, Overheim, he beat in the second. Walt Harris, he beat in the second. Greg Hardy, he took the decision. So, like, uh, Fabricio, uh, Fabricio Ward, I mean, he took, uh, knocked him out in the fifth and the fourth. So, like, he has, like, little spurts after the first round. We'll have some activity, but it's mostly, like, first is make or break for him. You could have, like, a Rosenstruck romanov situation, or it's just going to get really, really boring once it enters the second round. But that's really only for talent yeah. that's below the top five. I think that Toy Tai Vasa has way more power, and he's been showing a lot of improvements in his overall game. Like in the Derek Lewis fight, he was showing like some wrestling. Like he was showing different things that he hasn't shown before. And he was talking about how in his training camp, that is something he's trying to work on is develop the other skill sets uh, because the, the hands are what got him to the show. But now the division has shifted in such a way that like. Uh, Alexander Volkov's body type and his, his natural assets are not unique anymore. You got lots of guys who are lean, strong, have good skills in all the areas, right? That's not at all anything that's weird, especially in the top five. Um, and unfortunately with uh, Volkov, I think the time for him to be someone who could take like a number three spot from Tai Toy Vasa has long passed. He's just, he's, he's blew off too many fights past that golden opportunity where he was like the most fit, most in shape uh, at at a certain point, most well-rounded guy in the top five, but like, he just never gets his offense going. Like he just, he just doesn't for some reason. And Ty Torvasa is a finisher. He's got that power. He's got the tenacity and he's got a chin. I don't think Volkov has enough power to, to mess with Torvasa's chin. Um, He mostly has to catch you. He has to catch you right when you make a big mistake and then he has a shot at finishing you. Troy Vasa has really good fight IQ, even though he is a big boy. His striking IQ is very, very high. He's very good at evasions. He's very good at defense, and he's accurate. He can put a lot of power exactly where he needs to put it. So I think, again, this is going to be Volkov trying to challenge up and just getting slapped right back down. I see Ty Troy Vasa finishing him. Just based on his record, he does have pretty early finishes, so we're probably looking like, maybe first, second round finish. Because again, Volkov might have a strong first round. That's always his best round. But then after that, his volume, his technique, everything just freaking drops off. He's not fatiguing. He's just getting lazy or something. He just wants to sit back. He can't do that against Tyshaw Boss. He does that in the second round. I think he finishes him right then and there. Yeah, and I, I feel like with uh, Ty Turvasa, a lot of the downfall was he was staying in Saudi Arabia for over two years away from his family, training there, and he kind of got a little bit, he said he, if he watched the Embedded, he said he got depressed over the fact that he couldn't see his family for that long, for the fact that he was trying to 
train and, and then it just coincidentally in that time frame he had three of the hardest fights of his career where he got knocked yeah. down and uh for all three of those and now he's back in uh australia this fights in australia he's back and then he's doing a lot with cardio working with cardio and working with you know, crap on in the defense there but at the same time, I look at Alexander Volkov and what he's done in the last two fights. He's tremendously changed up his whole fight, and he's ro- rocking a two-fight win streak. If you look at the last time he lost to Tom Aspinall, since then, he's beat Alexander Romanov, and then he won uh, by knockout last time as well over... Uh, Rosenstruck. He beat Rosenstruck and then he beat Romanoff, both by uh, round one uh, knockouts. And I think the Romanoff one was especially because he did it from back control. And he was able to just fight him off. And uh, there's a lot in the Bennett that shows him going into this hyperbolic chamber where he just relaxes and he just lets himself let all the negativity out, and then he just lets all the positivity out, and it helps him train. He does it several times a week to help hmm. him train. This guy's coming in. He he has the height. He has the he usually has the reach in seventy five percent of his fights. This guy lands a lot of leg kicks, and then he can counter you with his hands. And just like you said, usually he fights a little bit of a counter game, but the last two fights he's been more uh, aggressive with his strike, and he comes in sooner he throws at you instead of waiting and it gets a guy like Ty Tori Vasu who he can throw the leg kick and that he's added uh, in the last couple of years and he has not got power but he relies a lot on that knockout power he's not going to throw a lot he's not going to have high volume and the longer the fight goes I think it benefits Volkov because he has that five round experience he has that cardio uh good cardio he just like you said if it goes down, it's because of him kind of getting a little bit uh, less active and then he waits on his opponents to fight. But now he's doing a different. It reminds me of Modestus Bukakis, where it's he used to be less active and more counter, and now he's more uh, aggressive. He knows that his he has to be this way because he's on the latter half of his career, and he still has that one eye, last chance to get that title fight because he's still at that five spot. No, no, the six spot, and then Trey Voss is at five. So he could beat Trey Voss. He can get that top three matchup uh, once more, and then it's like a make or break it there. Whereas, and he's riding a two fight win streak, whereas Ty Trey Voss is on a three fight losing streak. So I feel like there's more, uh, like, well, there's more, more to gain for both guys, but I feel like. I think I think you, you got to ride with Alexander Volkov on this one. I think he gets it done by finish round two or three late. I think Troy Titor Voss's chance is in round one. I think he might test Volkov, but I just like the fact that Volkov has been more aggressive in fights. He's pushing forward instead of allowing his opponents to do it to him and uh, to catch him on there. So I think he's going to play the aggressive uh, fight, make Titor Voss back up more. And then uh, and Ty Dorvas is going to connect on a few punches. But I think once round one hits, that's when Troy Vasa starts to go down cardio-wise. And then Alexander Volkov is just going to take over from there. So so I got him by round three. Oh, yeah. Oof. More time than and I then, um, but yeah, I think I like this matchup for a co-main, though. This is an interesting one. Yeah. And then if you look, the, the, there's a the uh, like a prop bet on here. It says Taito Ivasa by points or Alexander Volkov by KO, TKO. It's at minus 140. So you can get that marked down, and it kind of covers both sides. But uh, I feel like you know that Alexander Volkov, if Troy Ivasa doesn't finish him, he always gets finished because he always ties himself out, and then his opponents usually finish him later in the fight. That's what's happened. And I feel like Tui Vasa's chin is kind of compromised. Three straight KO losses. He can still take things, but he still get fin- he still gets finished in fights. And you're getting it at minus 140. So I feel like that's a perfect one for me taking Volkov in this one. I think he continues the win streak, gets it to three. 
And then from there, like, who knows when he gets booked because of, we talked about it off air. The, that top five is going to be hard to predict, uh, especially, say, Steve Bay shocks the world and beats John Jones, which I don't think he will. But, like, you got you got a log jam of prodigies in that top five. And Aspinall, uh, you got Sergey Pavlovich, and then you got the chance if Almeida can beat uh, Blades in the next couple of weeks, he would be added to that as well. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of fights that are waiting to be organized to find mm-hmm. out the next competitors in that uh, crowded top 10 of the heavyweight division. No, it's, it's definitely this one I think is, does have sort of that top five title contention weight to it, but it yeah. is still a fun matchup. I think we're it is. it's going to be. It is. I think the, the, I think the knockout capability of Taito Vas and how he always is fun. Yeah. He always throws cautions. The shoeys. Always, the shoeys. Yeah. <laughs> always makes the fight in heavyweight division uh, excited. Yeah. And then yeah. the fact that Alexander Volkov is fighting great the last two fights, it just yeah. adds to it. It just makes it more intrigue. Yeah. Uh, but before we move on to the heavy, uh, to the main event, we got uh, a couple uh, fights that were scrapped, and then of course uh, we talked about one. One was Manel Capping, Kai Car France. The other two that were scrapped on this fight card was uh, well, the other one, the main one that was scrapped was Vivian Arujo versus Casey O'Neill, which was supposed to be on this fight. The the lone women's fight was scrapped because Casey O'Neill got hurt, and I think they're pushing oh. it to a later uh, point. She got hurt coming back from uh, injury, and then she re-aggravated it, and it pushed her return back a couple months. But that was supposed to be on the main card, so that was supposed to be the opener on this one before it got scrapped. So, And, and then, of course, like just like you said, they had Kai Carl France and Manel Cafe, and then they had Addison and Jessica du- Duplessis before we found out that Duplessis was not going to be able to fight on this card. And he, he he asked for it to be pushed back a month. And then Addison said, I want to fight on on this Australia card. So that's why it was Sean Strickland. And that's a good mm-hmm. segue to the main event of the evening. We got the middleweight uh, championship fight uh, between the champion is Israel Adesana versus the challenger Sean Strickland? Izzy is coming in the minus 600 favorite, whereas Sean Strickland is coming in at the plus 440 heavy underdog status. What are your thoughts on this main event? So, when y'all watch the main event on the pay per view card, here's how it's going to go you're going to have that first fight with uh, Pedro and, and Pleasure Man, probably get a finish. Everybody's hyped. Then you get, of course, the big boys were all out, Tafa and Lane, another big finish there. Some crazy is going to happen, right? They're swinging heavy hammers. Then Cafe is just going to drive right through Dos Santos, easy finish. Uh, it'll be exciting, but real short. And then you got the Taitoi Vasa Volkov fight. Lots of, like, lots of punches being thrown back and forth. A lot of really intriguing fighting to watch. It'll be exciting. It'll be electrifying. And then they're going to roll out the main event, and it's going to be boring as shit. The whole 25 minutes is going to be boring as shit. So the problem is Adesanya likes to play the counter game. When he's forced to produce his own offense, he kind of sucks at it. He mostly just sends out ones and twos, occasional leg kicks with no setup. And then like he'll sometimes like teep to the body, try to do with the off occasional like kick to the head. Um, but like his, his offense is pretty rudimentary. It's just about like keeping enough points on the card to just stay just ahead. But ultimately, he's not doing like a Max Holloway approach, which is overwhelm them with volume and secure the round just on your volume alone. He just wants to stay just a little bit ahead on the cards. But really what he wants is the big counter shot to try to end the whole damn thing. And this is kind of what he's kind of been getting in his own way a lot of the time with this sort of approach pretty much ever since the Paulo Costa fight. So Paulo Costa was his last like big, massive highlight reel knockout. Um, You had Whitaker, Gaslim in there, Silva. Like those were exciting fights to watch. There was the Yoel Romero fight, which kind of falls in line with what's been happening recently, where Yoel refused to be the mad dog. He would not go in and brawl. He was like, no, I'm going to wait right here. I'm going to sit behind my jab. 
and I'm going to throw like ones and twos and you have to come to me. And then all of a sudden, out of sight, he was like, oh, well, they didn't come to fight. They didn't come. It's like, motherfucker, you got the belt. What do you mean they didn't come to fight? You're defending the belt. You need to come to fight. Don't, don't put it on them that you're not performing. And that tends to be like why, for example, the Vittori fight, the Whitaker fight, the Jared Cannonier fight, they were way more slow paced than we would have anticipated considering the names, especially with like the Whitaker fight. That was really, really close. It was a very controversial win because Whitaker was putting out the volume. What he should have done was mix in more grappling. That would have just secured it for him. But because it ended up being a standing fight, Adesanya was able to just maybe eke out the victory because he had a more significant strike. And, I'm sorry, a significant stunning strike. So he was able to like hurt Whitaker more often. Um, he was able to, especially in the later rounds, kind of edge out just a little bit ahead on the cards in terms of significant strikes. Um, so that kept him uh, just ahead of Whitaker the whole time and ultimately secured him a decision. But again, wasn't very interesting to watch. Vittori Adesanya 2 was boring as shit. Jared Cannonier uh, was a little, I think, too slow, I think, in that. If he had taken more risks, had been a little more bold with the striking, really had just gone after Adesanya and tried to lay more power on him, but do it in the way that Jared Cannonier does, which is like a very sophisticated kickboxing uh, style where he can fight at range because he's big as shit. Um, yeah. But he's also very accurate with his jabs, his teeps, his crosses. And that's where he could have put the power in to really have Adesanya on the back foot. Because that's what Pieria did. And Pieria knocked him out. So, like, that's a big thing that uh, I think Adesanya learned from. And then Pieria, the big thing with him is every time he goes crazy, he drops his hands, like, down here. Because he wants to be, like, throwing hands from the hips because they have a lot more power. And that's how and, Adesanya caught him on the rematch. And, 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 and then Izzy, and Izzy on, and ben said that he played possum. To catch yeah. him doing that, and then he just landed yeah. a shot because he caught him. Uh, probably saw it in the tape. It was super yeah. obvious if you watched the fight back. You're like, oh, that's yeah. not good. He <laughs> probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> so, he dropped so it I and mean, he started like, swinging, and then he just went like right. this, and then boom, landed the that's, shot. Strickland's not going to do that, though. Strickland no. is not going to do that. And this is why it's such a boring matchup. Strickland camps behind his jab. He throws out ones and twos. He doesn't really do much else. He does have um, a grappling background that he never really uses unless he's forced to use it. And then you see it every once in a while. Um, but for the most part, he mostly just wants to make it a point battle. He, he wins mostly by decision because he's very good at putting points up on the board. He has power. Like in his last fight, he did win by knockout in the second, mostly because he caught him. He just He caught him with a good shot. If he smells blood in the water, then he goes ape shit and tries to finish it right there. Um, but he does have a long enough gas tank to go all five rounds just waiting, 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 and just setting up very simple shots. And that sort of style doesn't really feed into Adesanya's counter game in any intriguing way. It just tells Adesanya, like, okay, I got to do my own, like, ones and twos, kick him in the legs a little bit, stay just enough ahead of the cards. But ultimately, I do want to get the big knockout finish so i'm just gonna wait i'm gonna wait till he messes up and then i'm gonna try to catch him with something and i remember we were talking i think it was the um i want to say it was the whitaker fight because everybody was kind of arguing about that one people were saying that adesanya was the more impressive fighter because he was controlling whitaker's actions with all the traps he was laying and my counter argument was like okay if you're a hunter and you're hunting rabbits and you're laying traps in the forest if you go back to your traps and you ain't got no rabbits, you can't say, look how impressive it is, how I controlled all the rabbits in the forest by where I placed my traps. Like I controlled where they were able to go. You didn't catch any rabbits. Like nobody cares, dude. Nobody cares. You suck as a hunter because you got no rabbits. That was sort of the thing with Whitaker. I feel like he could have won that if he had done just a little more grappling because he was showing a lot of growth considering their, their first go around. And he was giving Adesanya like a real test, a real run for his money. It was just he wasn't utilizing the one thing that Adesanya was weaker against at that time, which was the, the wrestling. And Sean Strickland, I don't think, is any big wrestling threat here. I really don't think he's going to be bringing a well-rounded threat. I think it's just going to be ones and twos. Now, weirdly enough, Sean Strickland is kind of – he has the approach that could potentially beat Adesanya. If Adesanya takes it too easy like he did with Yolo Romero, if he's too hesitant – Sean Strickland will just pass him up on the cards, possibly. I don't yeah. think that's gonna happen, but like he has the style to where like he could like on a on just like a just an off night for Adesanya, maybe make that happen. But ultimately, I think Adesanya is the more sophisticated, more well-rounded, more experienced striker. This is just gonna be a striking battle. It's gonna be a point battle, 
And I think Adesanya knows enough to stay ahead on the cards of Sean Strickland. He's also smart enough to mix up his strikes. He's going to be mixing in kicks with punches at different levels. Judges tend to see that as more activity, even if it's technically not, because there's more visually going on there. I think yeah. Adesanya's power is also a, a threat that uh, Strickland has to take seriously, um, especially with the kicks. High kicks to the head, he could finish it. Um, kicks to the legs will undermine Strickland's stability, which will also, over the long run, slow him down, take away his power. So I think with the the multiple threats there, Adesanya definitely has a huge advantage, not only in putting points on the board, but wearing down Strickland so that he doesn't really have a, any real shot at a finish. So all he's doing is playing catch up the whole time. So like I said, this is going to be boring as shit, but I think that minus 600 odds is there for a reason. I think Adesanya is going to eke out a very boring decision. But. I'm, I'm looking back at Sean Strickland's uh, record. Uh, of course, he beat Magomedov and Imovab, mm -hmm. which he took on a month, uh, like less than two weeks' notice after the the weird de decision law split decision to Jared Cannonier, where I felt like he beat yeah. Jared Cannonier uh, four, four rounds to one, but they gave it to Cannonier. And he took down Cannonier twice mm -hmm. in that fight. And the fight before that, he got knocked out by Alex Fajeda. There's no question that. Yep. And then the, uh, then he lost to Lezu Seleski by uh, a spin and hook kick round one. And then really the last two the losses. <laughs> and then in 2017, he lost by decision to Kamaru Usman. And then in Usman, 2015, man. he lost to Santiago Ponzinibbio. So it's not that bad of a losses. It was to uh, other than the Lazu one, it's to ranked opponents in middleweight and in welterweight. But in in a middleweight, I really take away the Canadian one because I felt like he lost, he won that fight. So mm -hmm. I really look at just the Fajita fight, which uh, is right. a glaring. He lost that one. But it's more of like a different kickboxer than with Izzy right. and, uh, because Fahid is more aggressive in his fights and he has more power than Izzy. And just like you said, Izzy relies more on counter striking and then here get more aggressive at times with his pl placement. But uh, I got Izzy by decision. I think Strickland's going to challenge him with the aggression. He's always moving forward. Uh, that's always been his thing. He's not going to be afraid to deal with whatever – is he offers him in the striking because he's going to move forward, utilize the drab, throw as much as possible. He's going to live and die by that sword. He's always done it. And he's going to keep on doing it. He's not afraid. He like other than those two uh, knockouts in the in his like ten year career, all of his fights go to decision, high volume, high output. He's uh, it's a strength. You might see him. You might actually see him mix in a takedown or two because he's done that the last three or four fights. He's at least averaged one takedown a fight in that span. Of course, he didn't get one in the Fajita because he got knocked out in round one. But other than that, he's had like two, one, one, and one. He always mixes it in there to uh, to throw things off. And even in the Abu uh, Magomedov fight, and that only went two rounds, he still had over eighty strikes in that. So his strike poor. A minute output is very high, and you're going to need that with a guy like Israel Adesanya who likes to keep the distance and avoid shots by always moving backwards. I think Strickland's going to challenge him. There's going to be a lot of close rounds. I feel like yeah. because even yeah, even I though I feel that. like Izzy's going to edge out these uh, rounds just because he can get a couple more kicks and uh, shots, Strickland's still going to land that jab. He's still going to push forward. And I, I could see a situation where it's easy by split decision because you're going to see those judges yeah. value, value the, the, the pushing forward pressure and landing shots. And when it's a very close round, that forward pressure where you're pushing the pace could change the, the conjecture of, yeah, yeah. of the round. But I still favor the champion in this one. I, I still got to see a little bit more from Strickland to give him this uh, – but I think there's more that like yeah. if he was able to be more consistent with the grappling, I might be more confident to take a whole lunge on him. But I think Izzy is the play and by uh, decision because he's going to be more counter and less aggressive. He's only aggressive when he wants to prove a point. 
And he proved mm-hmm. the point against Fajeda. He proved the mm-hmm. point against uh, Paulo Costa. And then he has gone back and forth with, with Strickland, but I think he knows he's going to beat him. So he's yeah. not even going to be as uh, aggressive in this one like he did uh, uh, playing possum against Fajeda. So it's going to be one of those close fights that is going to be close where you wish Adesanya would have just finished him early. Yeah. Like I said, it's going to be boring as shit, but Adesanya is probably going to retain the belt. Yeah. And there's really not that many uh, prop bets on this one to look at. Uh, other than if you look at it, it, is there Adesanya by decision? Shockingly, it's only plus 140. Uh-huh. By so it's actually really good odds, yeah, considering that uh, considering that when he doesn't want to uh, be aggressive, his fights tend to go to decision, yeah. unless he can catch Sean Strickland, which Sean Strickland does hold his hands down yeah. and leaves yeah, himself, yeah. but he does have a great chin uh, for for all the fights that he's done. So I feel like mm-hmm. that's the safe bet. You go with the the plus yeah. money there on it, it, is he by decision, and then you just ride it that way because. You're not getting anything from minus 600, and then you're playing with fire with hoping that it goes for a knockout. So, <laughs> no, my decision plus money is the safe bet there. And really, the over and unders, there's not too many on there right now. If you look at them, maybe go over three and a half rounds. It's at minus 145. So, if you want to play it safe, do that. Yeah. No, uh, this is, again, I feel like it's just going to kill the whole vibe of the card. There's like some of these fights, I think it's going to be mounting excitement. It's going to start off pretty fun. And then that, I think the Toy Voss of Volkov, that's the true main event here. Let's be real. It was once we get to the actual main event, everybody's been like, oh, shit. All right. Well, we were excited, but now we're just maybe heading toward the parking lot to get out of here before traffic hits and everybody's trying to leave at the same time, you know? I know, man. And, and then uh, other than that, that I wrap things up for two, UFC 293. What's crazy is next week we got a UFC fight night at T Boba Arena in Las Vegas. It's not, it's not a UFC Apex, and we get a championship fight on oh, UFC okay. Noches. That's Fun. what they're calling it because it's because no it's a uh, because uh, uh, I think it's for Spanish Independence Day. I think that's what oh, the that makes sense, so it's uh, UFC. So it's Noche nice. UFC. It's headlined by Alexa Grasso versus Valentina nice. Shevchenko. You got Kevin Holland versus Jack Del Madalena. Hmm. You got Daniel Zellhuber versus Christoph Giagos. You got Fernando Padilla versus Kyle Nelson. And then you got Raul Rosas Jr. versus Terrence Mitchell. And then the prelim main event is Tracy Cortez versus Jasmine Chisuda Vicious. And then we got a couple. Uh, you got Josh Fromm versus Roman Kapilov. And then and then oh, you got gosh. Roman. And then you got Lupita Godinez versus Elise Reed. So you got some re- uh, yeah, really good fights good. on uh, this card. And there was a bunch of uh, like cancellations on this fight where a lot of fights were moved. You're supposed to get Chad cat versus Mm. gasoline, but gasoline got hurt. You were supposed to have uh, Dana Rodriguez versus Santiago Ponzinibbio, but then Rodriguez tested positive for OST. And then you were, they just had uh, Yasmin Lucindo versus Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Josephine Natsa, and then the Sindo just had to pull out of the fight today. So yeah, her opponent, nice. I believe, just got uh, like a uh, replacement fight for that one. So there was a lot of this, even even though this fight is very, fight card is very uh, exciting on paper, it would have been even more exciting had some of these fighters not got injured. But I'm definitely looking forward to this, considering it's a fight night and they're doing yeah. it at Team Bilbo Arena. So you know they're, yeah. they're mean business with this one. This one looks better than this pay-per-view. Yeah, I was going to say, this is more stacked yeah. than the actual pay-per-view. This is awesome. <laughs> yep. So definitely keep out on all the action of our picks and predictions for UFC Fight night coming out next week, and we're either going to do it on Thursday or Friday. That's the the new time slot at three o'clock p.m. Eastern. So 
keep an eye out uh, for all that, all the news on that. But uh, definitely uh, uh, check out the UFC 293 picks and predictions uh, and definitely look at all of our bets and keep an eye out on Cage's bet slip that's coming out later uh, today since this is coming out on Friday. And just keep out uh, a lookout for all the action on the network. We cover uh, wrestling, we cover MMA, we cover football now. We're doing a lot more with football. Uh, with Terrorgate Tuesday, with Don't Be Out of Vantage, where Don't cover, covers Saints football uh, since he's from Louisiana. We do baseball, uh, fantasy baseball uh, shows. We do fantasy football shows. Yay. And we got more stuff coming out on the network as well in the future. So keep out, uh, uh, keep an eye out Saturday for the logo and name premiere of the new format for the channel. Keep uh, keep tuned into all of our action on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, and and view all the Cage My IQ content every Thursday and Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern on Cage My IQ and the network itself. So, thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll be back next week for you for Noche UFC picks and predictions. It's gonna be a lot better card to break down with more excitement. Mm-hmm. I'm your host, Cage. This is my co-host, Miles, and our mascot with him as well. But thanks Fighting for tuning in. <laughs> and thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you guys next week on another edition uh, keep of it real, Cage y'all. by Q. Peace. You silly boy. <laughs>